Today's show brought to you in part by our friends from Medallion Racing. Happy to say we're going to be doing a live event in Lexington, Kentucky, Wednesday night, April 28th. I'll be there. JK will be there. Michelle, you will be there. We're going to have a lot of fun with Philip Shelton and the team at Medallion Racing. To find out more about our event on Wednesday the 28th and how you can own a racehorse with Medallion Racing, go to medallionracing.com. Hello and welcome. This is a first of its kind show for the In The Money Media Network and our YouTube channel. This is the 2021 Kentucky Oaks Monster Pod. I'm your host, Peter Thomas Fornital, back with you, coming to you from the Brooklyn Bunker again, and extremely excited to introduce the man. He's in his usual studio there on the planet Texas. As you can see, he's the people's champion, Jonathan Pitchett. JK, what's up, my friend? The people's champ. I'm on the left. You can't do anything about it. Wait a I second. like it over here. <laughs> Wait a you mess with it. The there we go. That's back. That's back in. That's back in. Oh, geez. I'll let you. I'll let you be. I'll, I'll <laughs> give it to you. I'll let you be on the left. It's actually better because now you're where my monitor is. So when I'm looking at the monitor, I'm looking at you. We'll leave it. We'll let you have your way. He's. Uh, this is my. This is my good side. <laughs> There's no bad side when it comes to JK. We know that he's mischievous, but he's also a lot of fun. One of the most respected analysts in the business. We're going to be doing something a little bit different on this year's Monster Pod. JK, you're going to be properly co-hosting, as in half of these videos. You're not even going to see me. It's going to be you and a guest. Are you up to this hosting challenge? Yeah, I mean, look, your job's not that hard. Let's be honest. <laughs> right? So, so if you can do it, anybody can do it, right? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness gracious. Well, you know, I do both jobs. Now you'll be doing both jobs. Super excited about this. Uh, this was really your idea. We'd done the, the Derby Monster Pods the last couple of years. Very, very popular. Um, what put it in your mind that we should give the same treatment to the Oaks this year? Um, I, I think it's uh, honestly, it's because we have so many friends we wanted to get involved <laughs> that we needed more horses for our friends. We decided to expand a little bit. And then obviously I'm, I'm personally invested. One of my best friends, Jake Ballas, uh, has passed the champagne. And so I'm I'm as excited for the Oaks this year as I have been for any Derby that I've ever been to. I'm I'm really rooting for her and excited to see her run and and uh, the partners on Pass of Champagne. So this is my other reason why I'm so interested in the Kentucky Oaks this year. That's totally fair. A great race in its own right, and uh, we do have that personal connection. Do you think there's a chance Jake might uh, talk to us? Could he possibly be the guest for Pass the Champagne, or do you have another idea for a little bit later in the show? Oh yeah, it was either going to be him or Randy Hill, and and I don't know if these airwaves can handle any any extra <laughs> Randy Hill. So I went uh, I went with the big fella, and and uh, looking forward to talking to him about her. Like you on the Fox broadcast, J.K. known for your uh, natty attire, your 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 loud uh, shirts. Uh, Randy Hill can give you a run for your money, can't he? Yeah, uh, the experts say that last year was a tie between Randy and I. Uh, I'm going to bring my A game this year. Um, and, and see if I can't beat it. And unfortunately, uh, the, the, the shirts are sold out. That's that. I think that's, what's called a good problem to have JK. I should have mentioned. Also, you have your own shirt line. You can see a little glimmer of it back there, uh, behind you. That's fantastic. But the, the, the first run already gone. Yeah. I mean, you've got a, you've got a, you've got one coming. So I guess you could try to sell it on the black market. If someone wanted to pay extra. <laughs> I would never do that. That shirt is way too fresh. I'm keeping it. Folks will have to wait for their the next print run on that one. Um, best way to find it, I'd say, uh, go to inthemoneypodcast.com slash old smoke. You can use our promo code money. We've got our T-shirts. You can put in a pre-order or, or just send a complaint that the shirt's uh, sold out <laughs> before you got them. But they'll be back soon. We got a lot of business to take care of, JK. So I say we dive right into it uh, just after this message. Every year at this time, horse players can be sure of one thing. A friend is going to come at them and ask them who is going to win this year's Kentucky Derby. Well, I'll tell you what. You can tell them whatever horse you want. But if you want to give them a sure winner, if they don't already have a Twinspires.com account, you can get a free $200 if you bet $200. Check out all the details over at Twinspires.com or via the Twinspires app. Just make sure to use the promo code BET. 
200 to access this free $200. It's a rare, sure winner. So I don't know if you're back or if you're just starting. I think the Oaks is going to go after the Derby. We already saw you for the Derby talking about soup and sandwich. Never left. Yeah, but but if I'm wrong about the editing order, hey, Acacia, it's good to see you. Hey, JK, it's good to see you too. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, we talked a little about soup and sandwich, or we're going to talk a little bit about soup and sandwich. Crazy Beautiful, another horse that you got to see run down at Gulfstream this uh, this winter, mm -hmm. uh, the winner of the Gulfstream Park Oaks. Tell me a little bit about you, how you think her, she ch uh, her chances stack up in the Kentucky Oaks. You know, I'm a little bit hesitant with her. I do think that she's down in Florida faced some softer fields. It's unfortunate. It looked like in the Gulfstream Park Oaks, we were going to see Malathot. Um, she did not run there because of the mourning period after Sheikh Hamdan's death. It was out of respect that they waited to run her in Kentucky instead. And obviously we saw what she can do and how talented she is for Todd Pletcher. Um, it looked like Simply Ravishing might run in that spot as well. They also waited to go to Kentucky. Um, but luckily, Todd Fletcher and Ken McPeak have deep benches and they had a couple of other alternatives for Ken McPeak. It was crazy beautiful. Um, now he won the Gulfstream Park Oaks last year with Swiss Skydiver. Is she the next Swiss Skydiver? I don't think so, but she has dominated and I think done well in the fields that she has faced. Um, in the last two races that I saw her in the Devona Dale and the Gulfstream Oaks, she's been a physical standout. She's handled herself really well. She's developed a lot from the Breeders' Cup. And at this time of year, I think those are the positive things that you want to see. And props to Ken McPeak. I mean, as we saw with Swiss Skydiver and the Apple Blossom, he's game. He said, you know, she won the Gulfstream Oaks. She punched your ticket we're going to take a shot at the kentucky oaks now if you look at the uh, the chart callers that said in both of her starts at gulfstream that she was reluctant to load i mm -hmm. didn't remember seeing that but i know you pay a lot more attention to the gate i love uh i love your saying you always say that the young ones are like light bulbs christmas tree bulbs <laughs> like when they you know when one yeah. goes out they one all goes go out, out. Okay, i'll go out absolutely did, did you notice anything with her acting funny getting into the gate yeah, she's always been a, she'll balk a little bit at the gate. And those are kind of my notes, but I never took it as anything really major. The positive about her in comparison um, to Soup and Sandwich, for instance, who we'll also discuss, um, whereas he is like revved up and expending energy the whole time. She's very quiet and composed until she gets to the gate. And I'd rather it be that way that she's conserving energy until she gets there. It's not like she'll get in the gate and kind of rear up and cause a scene or hurt herself or or you know, get some of the other horses in the field to act up. She'll kind of balk a little bit, which is still typical of some young horses. I know um, that, you know, they had practiced working from the gate several times and that had been a key for her. But to me, it had never stood out as anything major. Obviously, when you're going to the Kentucky Derby or Kentucky Oaks, um, the waters are deeper. You're facing tougher competition. You want to avoid any potential options for mishap that's possible. Now, I was there um, on Fountain of Youth Day when the Devona Dale was run, and, and obviously a whole Bodie Meister won at like 117 to one or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, she wasn't that price, but, you know, I, I wasn't overwhelmed, and I don't want to get you to to say anything bad about the home team. I wasn't overwhelmed with the Phillies that we saw in South Florida this spring. Now, yeah. that's not always the case. Okay. Typically, I, I love the Phillies we see in South Florida. Um, do you feel like they are maybe a little a cut below kind of where we're looking with some of the other ones? I do. And, and that's just being very honest. Um, for me, the Devona Dale was kind of a throwout race and I was reluctant to give Crazy Beautiful really that much more of a look heading into the Gulfstream Oaks. I mean, like I mentioned, in last year's edition, we had Swiss Skydiver. So the quality typically is there. You're absolutely right. I don't think we had a Swiss Skydiver in the Gulfstream Oaks this year. Um, that said, they, I think, really kind of sorted themselves out into the Gulfstream Oaks, whereas the um, the Devona Dale and the Forward Gal, which is the race prior to that, was a, a Philly, another Shadwell Philly for Todd named Zigel, who I don't think really wants to go much further than a one-turn race. So it wasn't a horse that we'd be following onto the Kentucky Oaks group. So yeah, she hasn't faced the toughest competition as of yet. Um, whole Bodie Meister wired the field. She was a big price. We also saw Vquist, who was the two-year-old champion, not show up that day. Um, she 
she really kind of tipped her hand when she was out on the track. She looked like she had actually regressed as a three-year-old as opposed to moving forward off of her two-year-old campaign. And I, and I hope she comes back, but she had kind of tipped her hand that day. Um, whereas, like I said, Crazy Beautiful probably looked the best. And that speed, as we know at Gulfstream, really can carry on both surfaces. So I think that was kind of the case. Um, I think that the the Gulfstream Oaks was a formful race, but any one of them that steps forward into Kentucky Oaks Crazy Beautiful included, I think we'll have to improve. Yeah, Crazy Beautiful doesn't feel fast enough to me. Mm -hmm. But I will say this is that all the horses that got wins in these races where Lasix weren't allowed, I, I, I do give them a little bit of a look. Yep. I think that that's right. something to keep in, in, in mind when you're looking at the Kentucky Oaks. All the preps were run without Lasix. Um, and, the, and the Oaks itself obviously will be run without Lasix. And I think that that's a, a, at least one notch in the winner's belts of all of these races you have to give mm -hmm. them is that they showed up, they ran their race, they beat the other horses in there on a day where they weren't running on Lasix. Um, as it comes to Crazy Beautiful, do you think maybe loading later might be better for her? Do you think kind of getting in there early? When you see someone that doesn't want to load that well, do you think earlier or later is best? I think in her case, earlier might be a little bit better. Um largely because two, it once she's in there, she seems to be fine. It's the actual loading process. Um, if it's a horse that acts up in the gate, loading later is better because they don't have to stand in there for such a long time. If she loads later and she balks again, then you've got all the other horses standing in the gate already. They might start to get restless and that might delay her loading process even more. So I think actually going earlier would be a benefit for her. All right. Well, I'm sure Katie McPeak is waiting for the one hold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, he's probably going to be like, oh, no, Kasia wish that on me. Um, I just wanted to mention one other interesting thing about her that Kenny had actually told me after the Devona Dale and that he thinks that she actually prefers a one turn race, but she's shown she can be effective at the two turns and they want to give her a chance and take a shot in a race like the Kentucky Oaks. So I thought that was interesting, even coming from her trainer, being very candid about it, which Kenny always is, that this may be a little bit further than she really wants. Horse players love the word take a shot because you know mm -hmm. you can try to bet against. Yep, for sure. Acacia, I appreciate it. I will see you sooner than later. Yeah, love it. Thanks so much. Next up on the show, somebody who's going to be a familiar face if you follow horse racing. You've seen him in the work he's done at the fairgrounds, uh, maybe capital OTB. You're also going to be seeing his work coming out of the Churchill Downs notes team for this year's Kentucky Derby. Talking about uh, my friend and fellow Saratoga special alum, Brian Natto. How are you, buddy? Quite an umbrella under that Saratoga special <laughs> alum. I'm good, PTF. Everything's great. Back in Fort Lauderdale, a little respite. Uh, after the fairgrounds meet, which was just tremendous. Uh, so plugging away with capital OTB and then heading uh, the trekking to Churchill Downs in Louisville tomorrow, uh, Tuesday. And then I'll be part of the notes team for about 10, 12 days. So can't wait to see these horses, uh, all of them now up co close and personal and got to see quite a bit of them uh, in uh, New Orleans as well. And that's what we want to talk to you about. We're going to start off with the, the, the main reason you're here, and that's to talk about Travel Column, who many have marked down as the favorite for the Kentucky Oaks. I, I could make you a case that uh, it might be Malathot. I could even make you a case that it might be search results, despite her being a pretty big number in the international betting right now. But let's talk Travel Column specifically. When did you become aware of this filly? Well, I mean, you watch the Golden Rod, obviously, at Churchill Downs, over the track, a mile and a 16th. She had so much trouble that day, uh, and she responded so well and did it with, you know, with a plum, really, and, and beat Clary Air. So I think that was really her coming out party. And, you know, when it's Brad and OXO, you know what you're, you know, you're getting into, Brad Cox. So I think that was really her coming out party, Pete. And then she came down to fairgrounds and, and ran two bang-up races as well, continued the rivalry with Clary Air, and regardless of who you you know who you fancy, um, I think they're two of the ones uh, on on the last Friday in May this year. It's last Friday in April, even. April. It's uh, April. it's so confusing. I, I keep getting tripped up with that myself. It's th those two are interesting uh, point and counterpoint to talk about. They've got this budding rivalry. I have held with me the idea that it may be Clary Air yet who with a little bit more experience and uh, and a little more distance might uh, prove to be better. But Travel Column's gotten the better of her twice and uh, certainly seems to be coming into this the right way. How do you evaluate their chances relative to each other? It's it's an interesting rivalry, isn't it? And I don't want to uh, say Rachel Alexander and Zenyatta. That's not it at all. But they're very contrasting styles. 
So they're kind of like that. You know, Zenyatta came from the back, and Rachel Alexander had all that speed. Now, now Travel Column's not crazy speed like that, but she's very, very tactical. And, and I think that's why she's won two out of three. I think that's why whenever she meets Clarier, who wants to come from the back, she's not an out-the-back closer, but she's not going to be close early. So she's always at least a little bit up against it uh, when she's going to run against Travel Column. We're going to have a big field in the Oaks as well. And Travel Column showed this winter at Fairgrounds. I think she, in hindsight, got caught up chasing the pace a little bit and had kind of, I talked to Florent Giroux after the Rachel Alexander and he said, you know, I was in a tough spot. I'm, do I wait and run the risk of letting everyone catch up? Do I go early, make first run and then kind of run the risk of maybe taking a little bit out of my Philly late and, and probably in hindsight, maybe just a tad. That's how it, how it happened. And Clarier ran him down, but you know, you saw it in the fairgrounds Oaks Pete and, and, and the tactical speed of travel column is always going to give her a big edge over Clarier, a big edge over anybody f- for that matter. And, and I have to throw this out, you know, nine of the last 17 winners of the Kentucky Oaks ran in the Rachel Alexandra. Seven of the last 16 ran in, going into this year, ran in the Fairgrounds Oaks. Six of them won. So uh, throw in Serengeti Empress, who didn't, and then she came back to to win the Lily. So um, it's been a pretty key race, Pete, for whatever reason. Uh, maybe the Phillies need a, 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 just a little more time than the boys. I don't know, but that's a, those are, those are, uh, you know, facts. Those are stats. So keep that in mind too. It's interesting to look at the historical significance of that path that you got to witness firsthand down in new Orleans as a, a way to, to land the, the Lilies. I want to talk about a little bit more of the up close experience you've had. Uh, all you needed to do is watch that wonderful video uh, we saw that uh, our friends over at Betting on Content produced to, to know that. Uh, no offense, my friend, but but not exactly a natural born horseman, are you? But well, you I know. <laughs> <laughs> but by being up close and personal and talking to some of the humans so closely associated uh, with the likes of Travel Column, I know you're very good at at. Uh, sort of filtering out what might be described as a trainer speak or jockey speak and, and trying to get some real lessons about these horses going forward. What are your general vibes coming from the camp regarding travel column and her ability in this year's Kentucky Oaks? Well, I mean, Brad's always been super, super high on him. And the cool thing about Brad Cox is he's so candid. He, he's great in, in, in so many different regards, but he, he, he's also very fair in assessing his horses, you know, and uh, he knows the path that Fairgrounds has taken. He's won two of the last three Kentucky Oaks, um, Monomoy Girl, and, and She Dares the Devil. And he knows how to get to a horse to peak on what will this year be the last Friday in April or the first Friday in May. And he's, and he's brought, uh, he's going to bring one over there, you know, even a horse like Adventuring, who I saw up, up close and he called an audible and sent her to Turfway and, and she can get in. So he, he's done a great job. And I, and I, think I, I really firmly believe he feels he's bringing travel column in to run the race of his life only two races you know this is the third start of the form cycle third start of the year it was all according to plan and both her and in clary air for, for sure i mean they're, they're they're ready to run the race of their lives is it good enough on friday april 30th that's to be determined but i don't think they'll lose because they didn't fire their best shot Generally speaking, I'm loath to take one at the shorter end of the odd spectrum when they're not historically fast enough. In other words, I feel like even the best looking runners coming into this race are running below what you'd normally expect coming into a race like the Kentucky Oaks. Now, since it's true of all of them, I I can definitely see the argument that a runner like Travel Column has among the best form and and should maybe be leaned on anyway. But there's some part of me that's just wanting to try to reach and maybe find something at a bit more of a price for for the Kentucky Oaks, or at least would be more intent on uh, leaning on a Clarier who might end up being a double figure price uh, against the likes of Travel Column at the seven to two, four to one, whatever whatever she's going to be. Uh, does that give you any bit of pause about maybe wagering on a horse like Travel Column, or are you more inclined to just take her at face value, look at the Cox record in the race, and say, hey, she's going to fire her best shot? It doesn't matter what Phillies usually run before they go into the Oaks. Well, it is the elephant in the room, isn't it, Pete? We talked off the air, <laughs> you and I. I don't care what you know, figures you want to use or go by. They are all um relatively on the slow side 
and they are all very, very tightly grouped. Nobody is, as you kind of alluded to, nobody is above and beyond everybody else. So, yeah, I, I would be very hard-pressed to take $9 on Travel Column. I mean, she's my pick. Luckily, I'm vested in other areas with her, and uh, I don't need to take that price at the window. But, uh, yeah, I, I it's a tough oaks when you can throw a blanket over it, and whoever wants to run the race of their life, has a very good chance of winning. And, you know, uh, you could probably say the same with the Kentucky Derby as well. I just think that it's a different kind of year. There's no standout. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't be too enamored, Pete, at 3-1, to 7-2. to two. And when you're talking about Brad Cox and you're talking about Florent Giroux and, you're, you know, you're going to get those kind of prices, there's not a lot you can do. Before I let you go, just a quick word. You mentioned uh, conversations you've had with Cox about his Oaks runners. Curious if you've had a chance to talk with him about any of his Derby runners, either the one uh, Mandaloon, who seems to be garnering all kinds of wise guy attention heading into the race, or, of course, uh, the favorite uh, essential quality, or, or even Cotto Rivers. He still seems to be on the fence about whether he's going to go. What, what can you tell us about any firsthand experience or, uh, uh, the, with those runners? Mandaloon's funny, isn't he? Because he was like, you, you got him early and you were loving your spot. He wins a risen star. Then you're like, okay, great. I'm glad I bet him early because now he's like, you know, 10 to 1. Then a total bomb city in the fairgrounds oaks. And then he's <laughs> at the bottom of the roller coaster. And now he's working lights out. And it's Brad. And it's Judmont. And it's Florent Giroux. And now everybody seems to be back aboard. So um, Brad, again, very candid, had no idea what happened. I mean, he was where he wanted to be. He wants to be outside stalking three path, maybe a tad wide. The top two horses didn't come back, but yet there's Obesos rallying from last and garnering a lot of attention for our guys, our friends with West Point. It was a very fair square run race. Listen, the, 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 the uh, fan interest for Mandaloon forms behind me. That line, he was terrible, Pete. I don't know what, I, you know, I, I don't know what to say about him. Um, he seems to be coming in. Brad wouldn't run him if he wasn't, you know, tearing the barn down. You watch workouts. He seems to be going great guns. He's clearly now going to be the buzz horse again. I don't think there's anything about any doubt about that. Um, and much like the Oaks, Pete, if somebody feels like running the race of their lives, they're going to win this Kentucky Derby. Mandaloon's run fast before. Now, I don't like coming in off a of no-show six. It's not a it's not a path to success. I mean, that much we know. I I think of Thunder Gulch running fourth in the bluegrass, but he was like fourth beat in a length or so. You know, right. this was not this was not that scenario. But, um, you know, Brad said, in hindsight, I've got six weeks to work with him. Maybe that's a good thing this year. So um, he seems to be going great. Essential quality, I think, you know, Brad, every time you talk to him about these two horses this winter, he raved about them. And I, and I think, you know, even Brad said it as, as much. He said, I, I think it was a good thing we had to lay our body down in the bluegrass, you know. Um, I think we found out, hey, we can win a fight, too. We can beat East, we can beat overmatched horses comfortably, but we can pretty, beat a pretty darn good horse and highly motivated if he looks us in the eye. So um, I, I think that's a positive. Now, you know, four weeks out, did he lay too much on the line? We, we don't know that. We'll find that out um, next Saturday. And in Caddo River, I, I think just the fact, Pete, that, you know, Brad is wavering a little bit. Doesn't that kind of tell you the story right there? I mean, let's just uh, be honest. He didn't run an inch in the Rebel. And then, uh, I mean, he was second because when they run horse races, someone does have to finish second. And Concert Tour didn't fire his best shot that day. And now we see he's out. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know. A little tough to tough to think he can – he can go against 20 neck uh, in a couple Saturdays and fire his big shot. I will say this though, Cattle River brings a lot of speed to the equation if he is in there. So while he might not be a threat to win the race, you know, you're going to know he's in there and that could affect some other horses too. So there's still a lot to be sussed out, uh, you know, as we're what, um, you know, getting inside of two weeks now for the run for the roses. Brian, thank you so much. Great insight as ever. And we will uh, look for you uh, wherever we consume our, our horse racing because you're, you're pretty much everywhere. Appreciate your time today, buddy. You got it, buddy. Always good to talk to you, Pete. A little role reversal here. Uh, I've, I've, I've had you on the show before, the JK Plus One, so I kind of hosted a little bit there. But this is like a proper hosting situation. The the best host in the world. Well, also Greg Wolf, Lafitte Pinkai. What's going on? I get to sit back and like, critique from, from this perspective and then you do it you're all in the first like 27 seconds you're doing it you're doing a you're doing a bang-up job man 
I don't have I don't have nearly the amount of notes that you have uh, on the desk when you're working. Um, and I you don't, don't have need the, them. See that? I don't see, have that's the, real talent. That's real talent. <laughs> that's real talent. See, you don't need them. I don't have the colored pen either. Where is my yeah. man? It's around here somewhere. <laughs> it's around here, like it's around here somewhere. Well, I, I appreciate you joining us. We're obviously talking through all these Oaks horses, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about search results. The undefeated Chad Brown filly comes in here. And I think sneakily, she's going to take some money. I, I, she's undefeated. It's Chad. There's a lot of reasons to think that's going to be the case. Yeah, so first off, her, her name like screwed me up for like two weeks. You know, wanting to learn a little bit more about search results and doing some of the research on the Oaks Philly, like Gazelle winner search results, right? So that that first and foremost is kind of you got, kind of throwing me a you little got, bit. You got a lot of nerve picking on that poor Philly. Try saying you want to call Lafitte Pinkai on Siri. <laughs> that, <laughs> that, <laughs> she's on my last nerve. Siri's <laughs> on my last nerve, man. Um, search, search. She's like search results is like unblemished but she's not, she, she's not, but she's blemished. She's a perfect three for three, but I think we all have certain, certain pet peeves in racing, whether it comes from a handicapping perspective or if we're fans of a particular horse, sometimes you see something and it, it just kind of shakes you a little bit. And her habit with this lead switch thing really bugs me. Like I'm a big soup and sandwich fan to the Derby in terms of his ability, but until he gets this lead swap thing straightened out, to me, that that's a detriment. And now he, he breezed the other day at Churchill Downs and he swapped nicely, but you know, that's practice, Alan Iverson. It's different in the afternoon. Search results in her first race. Um, she didn't break. Uh, what I did like is she she sat in behind the leaders, inside of horses. Like she took a lot of dirt and that didn't phase her at all. Angled to the outside, accelerated nicely, and was late switching her lead. Uh, in the Busher and in the Gazelle, both nice stakes wins in New York, she, like, she never swapped. Like, you don't, it's not a must. A firm essentially won a triple crown on his wrong lead, but as talented as she is, as much upside as she has for me, that, that's one concern going into the Oaks, not knowing if she'll, when it's time to find that fifth year, you know, can she, will she, will she do the right thing? So when it comes to lead changes, is your concern or issue with them focus or is it that you feel like maybe they're getting a little bit tired? I know in lower level races, when we look at lead switches, we think maybe there's an issue. They're, they're, they're favoring one side or the other. I don't think we're going to experience that in the Kentucky Oaks with these types of horses, but what, what's your main concern when it comes to lead changes? No, it's not in a, a physical issue thing. Like I sim think something's bothering her. Chad Brown trains her. She wouldn't be there if there was anything physically wrong. I think it's a, it's a matter of, of maturation. Uh, whether you're talking about the Derby or the Oaks, these are the finest three-year-olds in, in North America running in the most prestigious races for three-year-olds, Phillies, or, or the boys in the Derby. And like you have to separate them somehow. So they're all talented. Most of them have pedigree, and they're trained by some of the very best in the business. So you're splitting hairs looking for, for faults, essentially. And this is a glaring one in that like search results may have yet another gear. But I don't know if she's gonna if she's gonna find it when necessary. If there's, for example, if I'm watching a race and I don't know who the horses are and they're head and head at the eighth pole, and you tell me, all right, one of these two is gonna switch leads, the other isn't. Like, eight out of ten, nine out of ten, give me the one that switch leads. Typically, that's the horse that's gonna win a, a close battle when push comes to shove. And for a few strides, I can't remember her name. The Philly Kendrick Carmouche was riding in the Gazelle. It looked like looked like she had looked like he had she had a shot. And I think something, some of that had to do with search results while she outclassed the group on her left lead throughout, not being able to shift her weight, find her right lead, and finish that much faster, finish that much stronger. In the event that you're still with us, if you're a new casual fan who likes to bet sports and you've Googled Kentucky Oaks betting and you've fallen into this conversation, when we talk about switching leads, we're talking about horses, they, they have a lead leg at certain parts of the race, and then they're trained to switch. They're on their left lead on the turn and their right re lead in straightaways, and it's kind of an energy situation. You know, Think about uh, when you're carrying that bag down the street and you're switching hands a little bit like that. That's what we're talking about here. When we're it, talking that, about that, that's, 
sorry to, I sorry to cut you off, Jonathan. That's the yeah. best description I've I've ever. Uh, it, when the way it was explained to me was, you've just landed in an airport. You're trying to make that connecting flight. You're trying to run from one end of the terminal to the other. We've all been there, and you have like a heavy duffel bag, and even subconsciously, while you're running, trying to make your connection, you're switching from your stronger arm to your weaker arm. At that point, fatigue sets in. Your stronger arm is your weaker arm, and now you have the bag in the other hand. And if you weren't able to do so for some reason, let's say you weren't able to move that bag from this arm to that arm, you might stop altogether just to catch your breath. And I think in some cases, horses that don't switch leads, they don't switch that the weight from one side to the other, pretty much they, they lay down. They stop trying. Fatigue sets in as opposed to shifting that weight, putting that bag in the other hand. You're able to run through that terminal, make your gait a little bit quicker. The same applies to horses. I don't run through the gate. I stop and have an adult beverage, but it's a difference between you and I, I suppose. Um, Not necessarily. Not necessarily. <laughs> one, of, one of my friends that was on the show, Jack Jenkins, he said something I thought was really funny. I thought you would enjoy. He said, when you look at this Kentucky Oaks and you look at the past performances, it feels like you're looking at a Breeders' Cup juvenile race. There's so many horses making their third and fourth starts. It seems a little bit like there's an opportunity for somebody to jump up does anyone catch your attention that maybe we're not talking about you think is interesting in this uh, in this race? I'd probably have to do I, – um, I'm such a big uh, – is it, Mal, is it Malathat? Mal, I should Mal probably figure that, that out. In the is it Thad or Thought? I don't Mal know which one Mal it is. Malathat. The filly that won the Ashland I am a <laughs> huge fan of. So I'm going to probably do the deeper dive for long shots and value for the Derby. I don't – because I'm so high on Malathat um, – I, ex I do expect her uh, to win. So uh, from a uh, looking for that long shot, no, nobody's really. I'd, I'd be manufacturing a long shot for the sake of for the sake of the show. Oh, um, I agree. I mean, yeah. I like I like Passa Champagne for lots of different reasons. Um, obviously, she was second to the horse that you're talking about, Malif, that you like so much. So I think she is. Uh, I think she's. I think the winner. I felt like when I left Keeneland that day, I felt like I saw the winner of the Derby and the Oaks run that day. That both the Bluegrass and the Ashland are going to have major impacts on the Derby and the Oaks. Malathat, what, what I, she has a killer instinct. We saw it in her final start as a two-year-old in the Demoiselle when, you know, that wasn't Milfoyle tiring and stopping. Malathat went out and got her. The filly you like passed the Champagne in the Ashland that she wasn't, like Malathat went out and got her. Um, there will probably be some concern about Malathat regarding only one start this year. But remember, she, she's a Shadwell filly. Um, and after, after Sheikh Amdan passed away out of respect, no shot, no, no Shadwell horses were racing for an extended period of time. We would have seen Malafat in the Gulfstream Park Oaks. Uh, she missed that start as a result of his, uh, untimely passing. Uh, she, we, we saw her in the Ashland. She looked great. Uh, if there was any rust to shake off, she shook it inside the final 16th of a mile. She is, and looks like a boy and they're having these training sessions at Churchill Downs with the Oaks Phillies and the Derby boy. Like she looks like a boy big big stout philly lp3 i'm gonna see a bunch of you this summer i, I hear we're gonna be living close to one another hope you're not up partying yeah, late at like, night I don't no know. like what could possibly go wrong <laughs> like, what could possibly go wrong like a joint houses well we're very close to salevo so uh, <laughs> it, it could it could get wild what could possibly go wrong man uh, and I got the I got the deadliest catch from here to catch to, to to watch tonight as well. So we're getting off just in time. We'll get there. I'll see you. Uh, I'll see you in Louisville next week. Probably. I know you're going to be busy, but I'll catch you at least for a hug, and then I'll, I'll see, see you there. a whole bunch this summer. Always a pleasure, man. Talk to you soon. Next up on the show, very happy to have back with us a man who's been part of our In the Money Plus service, talking about Oaklawn throughout. The meeting there, very sharp handicapper and horse player, also a horse owner with our friends and founding partners over at 10 Strike Racing. Clay Sanders, how are you today? I'm great, Pete. Glad to be here. Missed you at Arkansas Derby this year, but it's uh, it's it's great to have you uh, on the Monster Pod. Uh, well, we missed you too. We need to get that uh, back in the rotation and then we get this pandemic behind us and get the party rolling again. <laughs> we are here today to talk about uh, the Kentucky Oaks and specifically a filly named Will Secret, who I understand you have a positive history of wagering upon. Yeah, I had a good bet on her in the Martha Washington. Uh, she was coming in off that maiden win uh, down at the fairgrounds. Uh, I think she was against that day and uh, wide open Martha Washington. She went off at eight to one and uh, made a pretty big wager on her that day. And I think I keyed her in some picks and uh, had a pretty profitable day. 
Yeah, that's right. That was a uh, was that was was that a, a, a decent rail that day at the fairgrounds and ended up uh, ended up with a wide trip and still um, being able to 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 get the job done in that right. in that maiden win uh, and then uh, improved at uh, in the stake at at Oakland. Were you thinking at that time that this could be a Kentucky Oaks filly? I did. I did. Uh, I, you know, she's bred no longer. Um, you know, Dallas's horse tend to mature a little bit later. Um, I was expecting her to continue making some moves forward. Didn't necessarily happen uh, in the next two races. She kind of ran the same figure, which, you know, gives you a little bit of a pause uh, when you project her into the Oaks. Coming off those wins, then had a little bit more of a class test in the Ashland. That, uh, didn't disgrace herself there. Ended up coming making one run and uh, coming from the back to to snag third this isn't looking at it it's not bad form and this is a trainer she's shown she could finish a little bit and this is a trainer certainly no success to running up into the number at uh, huge prices on racing's biggest days uh, do you give will secret a chance to repeat that uh, dallas stewart trick uh, of maybe being able to get up in the number at a price or is that ceiling too low could she even win the race I don't think she can win the race. I, do, I just don't think she's fast enough. Um, you know, she's raced seven times, which will be so high in the race with Crazy Beautiful. I think she has less likelihood of making that, you know, three-year-old step forward that, you know, they can make it this time. And surely she could. She's bred to get the distance. With maybe some of them won't. But I, I agree with you. I think she's kind of with that Dallas, hey, you know, get up in the number. If you notice her running style changed a little bit, maybe some of it was just because she was closer in some slow paces where she ran better. And I think really that's why she can't win this race because her two big wins came in slow paced races. And I just don't like those kind of horses in a race that, you know, the Oaks going to have a full field. I'll be shocked if we don't have quite a bit of pace, but with her being more an off the pace, you know, in the Ashland, that gives her that opportunity to be that clunk up Dallas Stewart special where, you know, gets underneath in third or fourth, which I really think I, I would think here in the third or fourth, but I definitely think I would use her. And include for you in those deeper exotics. That makes sense. I know you uh, you have some connection to this uh, to this owner, at least have been a been a fan of, of these runners for a long time. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Willis Horton grew up about eight miles from my dad in North Arkansas. Uh, he was born in Leslie, my dad in Marshall. I remember as a, I guess it was in 2003. So I was probably, you know, mid twenties. Uh, they had a women's forever with uh, Dallas Stewart and it, uh, I think they paid $96 in the Oak. So obviously these connections can get it done on this stage. I remember betting on that when they tipped the horse out to us. So, uh, you know, they're, they're fun people, and uh, Willis likes to have a good time. He's always smoking, drinking bourbon at all the racetracks and the Clips Awards. <laughs> our, kind of, our kind of owner is what you're saying. Absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> Any chance we'll be seeing you in, in uh, Louisville this year? Will you be watching from afar? I'm going to be uh, playing from afar. If I don't have a horse running, I like to be in my uh, home office uh, with all my TV screens and uh, different uh, computer programs to help me uh, take advantage of the great wagering on Oaks and uh, Derby Day. Wait a second. Are you telling me there's a Memphis bunker too, not just a Brooklyn bunker? You got a Memphis bunker working? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. It might not be as uh, refined as yours or Marshall's, but I uh, definitely have quite the arsenal of uh, it uh, working on my uh, handicap i think marshall refers to his as a war room if i'm not mistaken there you go, there you go. <laughs> all right clay well thank you for your thoughts on will secret in this year's race uh, any other uh, quick thought do you have any burning horses you you want to talk about real fast for the oaks or the the derby before we uh, before we let you get out of here you know, I haven't solidified my opinions uh, yet. Uh, I'm hearing a decent amount of buzz on Clary Air. You know, she had that really nice work uh, this past weekend. I like to see how all these horses work. You know, she uh, has been battling, uh, you know, comes out of that really competitive uh, fairground Oaks. She's a curlin of a Bernardini mare. I mean, she's bred to do well here. Um, Asmussen, you know, he's, he's hot in these big races. Uh, I just think she's kind of likely. But, I, you know, I think this is going to be a wide open Oaks. It's really exciting. So, you know, my opinion may change between now and then, but she's one that we're going to take a hard look at. On my radar as well. Clay Sanders, thank you so much for your time today. All right. Good luck, everyone. Well, this is the one that I've been waiting for. Uh, I guess this is going to be the end of a friendship. And um, 
our friend Jake Ballas obviously is involved uh, intimately with past the champagne and, and uh, you have a great relationship with Jake. And when we asked you which Philly you wanted to talk about in the Oaks, you picked Malathot. Shawnee, what's going on? Did I? Is that accurate? I thought I was assigned Malathot. Was this, are, you? are you throwing me under the bus here? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm pretty know. sure. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Cloudy. I don't know. Uh, I, I called you the day after I said, Sean, are you trying to make the big fella mad? Why, what are you doing picking uh, Malta? Yeah. You know, I got to be honest. I love Pass the Champagne. I think she's really nice. My initial thought when they hit the wire in the Ashland was, damn, there's the Oaks winner right there. And it was Malta. That doesn't mean Pass the Champagne can't win. I think she can. I think, you know, they're both improving horses. They're both really good. Um, but I think Malathot should be and probably will be a deserving favorite. Yeah, and, and the thing is, I look, I mean, obviously I'm rooting like heck for Pastor Champagne, but I, I, I do feel like if I'm looking at it objectively, Malathot has a legitimate opportunity to improve off that effort. Absolutely. She didn't run for a very long time. Uh, I think she was off maybe like 130 days, 115 days, whatever it was leading into that mm-hmm. race. Uh, they had to change the schedule because of the passing of Sheikh Hamdan, not running down at Gulfstream and then to ship up and they ran and, and all of these things. And she still ran well that day. Uh, the pace wasn't particularly fast. She was closing into, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about her, her late pace numbers, but she's got an opportunity to, to step forward. And, and from yeah. everything I've heard, uh, Todd's really high on her, he, and I think he 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 thinks that she's got a chance to be pretty special. Obviously, her her breeding suggests that to be the case. What what is it about her from a from on paper standpoint that you like? I just I like everything I see about her. You know, she's shown the ability to sit close to the pace on the outside and and run well. She's shown the ability to be inside speed and run well. She's shown the ability to be down in the pocket on a day at uh, Aqueduct where I didn't really think he wanted to be in the pocket, ran well. Um, and then last time she showed the ability to sit on the far outside in a slow pace and and run down a really talented horse that got, got the jump on her and, and finished really fast. She just looks like the total package to me for, for what you want in an Oaks horse. Royally bred, very talented. She checks all the boxes, in my opinion. What was the LP for both horses in that last race? Kentucky Oaks were the LPs. Uh, Malathot ran a one hundred and three, and past the Champagne. Give me one second. Well, you're 90. looking at. Let's say it again. Ninety nine. Ninety nine, and both, I think it's really. really good. Yeah, I mean, we if uh, I don't know which video the viewer or listener is listening to first, but Sean talked about knowing agenda um, for the Derby, and, and his LP was a hundred. So if we're comparing those, it, it definitely feels like these horses shouldn't have a problem going the mile and a, the mile and an eighth off of that mile and a sixteenth effort. No, I don't think any problem at all for especially for Malathot. And one thing I will say about the Ashland, it's something I've always tried to keep in mind, is that it is run on that short stretch mile and a 16th. So it's a different configuration. So, it, and it's hard to know whether or not Malathot or Pass the Champagne appreciate running the turns or running the stretch better. You don't know. You really don't know which one they like. But it's at least something to keep in mind that there's a possibility that Pass the Champagne ran so well because she liked the configuration of the short stretch. And, right. or even, or you can go the other way too, that maybe she didn't run as well because she didn't like it. Maybe she's going to be better with a longer stretch, but I, I think it's something to at least consider that what you saw in the Ashland could be different than what you see in the Oaks. Absolutely. I totally agree. Well, um, I, I, I told you before that I'll see you soon to, to, to eat lunch, but I'm, I worry that if Jake's there, you're not going to be invited after you, you got on here and talked about Malathon. Yeah, I said some nice things about Pastor Champagne. I would like nothing more than to see her win that race. I know. But I, you I guys told me to talk about Malathot. So <laughs> talk her up, talk her up. So I did. Yeah, you're blaming it on us, of course. <laughs> of course. Um, Sean, on uh, do you see yourself getting involved in like a Derby Oaks double? Is that a play as a, as a professional player? Is that a play that, that you like to get involved with? I feel like it's a pretty a fan heavy wager that I I feel like you could probably find some meat on the bone. Yeah, I am. I, I do plan on betting it this year um, because I, I have strong opinions, and 
one of my strong opinions is I'm sort of anti-essential quality. And in that particular pool, I would, I would bet against him and other pools like the pick six, I'll certainly use him, but I, you know, for a double, I probably will just play a, a Malathot into known agenda and Borbonic double. Just go all T Pletch all the time. Man, I got I I can't let you get away with without uh, giving uh, at least a couple sentences about uh uh bur- I've actually heard it's Bourbonic, but Bourbonic, okay. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I was saying Bourbonic yeah. all day today and then I got yeah. corrected it's Bourbonic. What what is it about that horse you like? A little Kentucky Derby bonus coverage on this Oaks monster pod. He's just got sort of the profile of some of these horses that run big at big prices in the Derby to me. Um, you know, same stuff we talked about with these other two is he's got a legitimate late pace figure. He's improving. He's, you know, bred to run long. I just, he, he smells more like a third or fourth kind of horse, but this Derby isn't full of horses that have proven to be um, legitimate Derby horses, in my opinion. And, those are the kind where you can get some weird stuff happening. You know, essential quality really hasn't improved much at, from two to three, and he sort of just is what he is. And no agenda gets a bad trip. Anybody can win this race. So, you know, I like to bet on the ones that have proven that they can they can finish races, and Bourbonic has done so. Shawnee, I He's appreciate it. Plus. Huh? He'll be a huge price. I think. Oh hell yeah, he'll be he'll be big. You think he'll be over fifty to one? I think in some of the gimmick pools, he will be. I think on the tote, he probably won't be just because they sort of squeeze that market to the middle a little bit and overbet some of those longer price horses. But I think in picks, yeah. I'll probably drink enough bourbon, and I like Kendrick enough that I'll wager on him and make him at least 49 to 1. Okay. Well, there you go. Good for you. Sean, I appreciate you. Love you, man. Love you too. Next up on our Kentucky Oaks Monster Pod, extremely happy to welcome to our airwaves a very familiar face. You know her from the Santa Anita simulcast feed work she's done on the networks. You know her from the owner's box right here on the In the Money Media Network. I'm speaking, of course, about my friend, Michelle Yu. Michelle, how are you today? Hey, Pete. I'm good. I'm good. You know, very interesting shot there. It appears that you have some sort of large cocktail in front of you. I do. You can't you can't hold out on us. What? What? Have we, now, I've only know. You know, I know you as a, as a champagne aficionado. But what? What do you have there? Some some class of chocolate martini or something? It is an espresso martini. Okay, I, I was close. I can't afford to drink the champagne I like every night. And even if I'm a good girl and I stretch it out over two nights, that's still you know it's forty eight dollars a bottle. I, <laughs> I just can't afford that. I don't get paid enough. So in between uh, opening up bottles of Vouv, this is kind of like my go to cocktail. I used to just drink Grey Goose Gimlets on the rocks, but after I had kids, I just needed to like relax on that. Although I have to say my espresso martinis do involve like six shots of alcohol in each one. People come over for happy hour every Friday. <laughs> and, like I'll make them one and they're like, oh, this is good. I'll, I'll, I'll have another shirt. And like halfway through the next, they're like. <laughs> they're Feeling little, the effects. They're a little uh, high octane for sure. And, and I need I need to correct you. You can't just say Vuv. You have to say Vuv. Not a sponsor yet. When you, oh. when you say that, not a sponsor yet. We'll get them. We'll get them eventually. Own for 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 owners box, and then you know you don't have to worry about that. If you need to go scan my bar area where I have two dozen <laughs> bottles, I will. So then they can see that like we legitimately drink it. That's awesome. Good stuff. All right, you're here on the Oaks Monster Pod to talk about beautiful gift. Bob Baffert's filly uh, was second in the Santa Anita Oaks. I feel like anytime Bob Baffert sends out one on a big day, uh, you're crazy to just ignore it entirely. What can you tell me about what you know about Beautiful Gift? And do you think she's a serious contender in this horse race? I don't exactly know if she's a totally serious contender. I think she's probably a horse for the minor awards, in all honesty. Um, You know, I think that the thing with Baffert is, like you said, when when he sends out a horse, you think it's got a legitimate shot. But he ends up with, you know, maybe one or two standouts and then like six or seven horses that would be a standout for anybody else and then are just second tier in his barn. I kind of feel like she's that type of horse, right? She didn't break her maiden first time out. um, And then she came on to win in the Santa Ynez. She got this trip where she was behind and she was um, down on the on the inside saving ground, though. And they started to move her early, right? Come on, start going, start going, start going. And then when she turned for home and angled out, she really, really exploded, I feel like, for her. And got the got the job done on the wire in time. 
But what I lacked from her was like a feeling of like her being super dynamic. I think she got a really great trip that day um, and it just worked out for her. She doesn't seem to have like an instant turn of foot punch and she doesn't have a lot of early speed, which is something that we tend to see from the Bob Baffert horses. So like then you go back to the Santa Anita Oaks and, you know, her and Mraz were throwing down again. That was the horse she bested in the Santa Ynez. And Mraz went out to the front because it was a short field. And I felt like Beautiful Gift was kind of, I don't say hustled out of there, but, you know, she was sitting outside. And even though they went kind of slow early, which I saw the rider like check her maybe once or twice just to not go as fast. They didn't get her into like the rhythm that I think she needs to have that like kick at all. Um when she came all the way down and uh, they like stretched out towards the wire, I thought she fought on really well, but she had to take the overland route where Suse came up the rail like right inside. She was like, these guys are going way too slow. I'm going to go up inside. <laughs> and she was just stuck outside, right? So she's not a horse that's trying to turn her foot. I don't think that she's like A++++ plus 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 talent, like going to win the Kentucky Oaks by 10. It's hard for a horse that's not that good to make up a lot of ground, right? Or give away that much ground. So parked on the outside, I thought she was still valiant. She's very workmanlike. I think from a pedigree standpoint, she really should want to go the nine furlongs, maybe even farther. And she has that feeling to her of like, I'm a route horse. I'm just going to plod, 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 plod. I think the biggest key to her is that she needs to not be rushed at all. Like she needs to just, wherever she breaks, let her relax. And then start moving early. Like, just say everyone moves the top of the stretch. Move in the beginning of the turn. Start to ask her and start to get that momentum rolling. You know, she's going to have to unravel herself to get into a good stride. I think that's a good description. And I was going to ask you specifically about the pedigree. Certainly interesting. You know, debuted at five and a half. That seemed too sharp. Ends up breaking the maiden at eight. And then coming back here by Medallia Doro out of an AP uh, Indy Mare Sea Gift. I just mm -hmm. did feel like if there's a chance for her to get on the board, it probably has to do with getting the right kind of ride and just a, a pedigree to keep going when others are maybe looking for a place to lie down. I, I was just curious what you thought in terms of uh, the price she might be in this race and, and if she could uh, get that kind of set up and, and we should keep her on the radar for our wagers. I think that her price is probably going to be pretty generous, in my opinion, for a Bob Baffert runner, um, because she, especially because she got beaten in the Sandy to Oaks, and I feel like when a lot of people look at the list of Oaks contenders, she doesn't jump off the page. You're not like, oh yeah, beautiful gift, I loved her race, right? She's just been that horse that's kind of picked up some pieces and won a race in a small field, and she hasn't been dynamic or brilliant. So I think you're going to get a really square price on her if you like her. The key to her is seriously going to be the the trip, in my opinion. She has to be moving early, and she can't be rushed too soon. Um, you know, does she want to stay the distance? Yes, but I don't think that she's going to show you like a brilliant turn of foot or anything. And I feel like a lot of these races, if you're not forwardly placed, um, you're at a de a real deficit, right? Like I, I think the forwardly placed horses, especially in these races, just have a huge advantage. You know, there's a lot of horses going forward. I don't think that she's one that can make up the difference if they have to go five or six wide around the turn. She's not that good. But I think she's squarely one to use underneath in your exotics if you're playing supers or something because she's going to be a good price, especially as a Bob Baffert trainee, and we know the nine furlongs I think is really going to suit her. Now, if she wins, uh, congratulations, everyone that liked her. I could not see her finishing above third, in my opinion. 12 to 1 internationally now. We'll see what price on the day. Do you have a horse that you really are interested in betting on top in this year's uh, Kentucky Oaks? Are you still formulating I, your opinion? I'm still formulating my opinion because I want to see works next week. That's kind of my like, like I'm doing works right now for XB for the Derby. And I, I'm just like, why are we even watching these? Unless, because I like to wait <laughs> to the last week and then I like to watch back as many as I can, but I kind of don't like to do it as I go along because then I feel like, I don't want to say jaded. But then I, I find like one good work and I compare everyone to that one work when I really want to compare each horse to themselves. And speaking of her recent work, she worked on the 16th of April. Um, she worked with a horse named Desmond and Desmond was a really good horse last year for Baffert. Like he's a decent allowance type horse, right? He's not a superstar. 
she was best in the work. She worked okay. Bob said, though, before, the reason they gave her a pretty big break between breaking her maiden and coming back in the Santa Ynez is because she got light on him. You can already see, if you watch back, like, a couple works back and then that April 16th work, she's getting a little light again. So, um, you know, I think that the ship is probably going to be hard on her as well. Interesting stuff. All right, you will be with us to give your more uh, fully formed thoughts on the Oaks when we do our final answer show live from Lexington next week. So we'll, we'll hold your feet to the fire then. We'll let you off the hook for now. Michelle, thank you so much for your thoughts on this year's Kentucky Oaks. Cheers, guys. Jack Jenkins, it's been a long time since you've been on uh, the In the Money Media airwaves. Glad to have you back. Oh, it's great to be with you, JK. So I, I want to talk a little bit about this Oaks race um, as, as a whole, but then you have this unique talent and, and it, it applies to Milfoy. And so I want to get to that, but what do you think about this group as a whole, this Oaks field? Well, you know, the, the thing about the, the Derby and the Oaks this year is uh, there's so many horses that are just so lightly raced, you know, um, a lot of them are still, you know, eligible for allowance conditions, you know, and a lot of them is making their, their fourth or fifth start of their career coming, coming into this race. And it's really, you know, it kind of, kind of almost, <laughs> if you just look at the PPs, it looks like you're handicapping a Breeders Cup juvenile field rather than a, you know, Kentucky Oaks or Kentucky Derby this year. As far as Milfoy, uh, the, the thing that, that I noticed in, is that in, in the times I've known you, is your predictions on what a horse will ultimately want to do, whether it's ultimately will want to go longer, will want to sprint, We'll want to be on the grass. We'll be a turf sprinter. We'll want to go as long as they'll write races. Your batting average there is, is outstanding. And, and when I talked to you about this race, you had mentioned to me that you felt like Milfoy will eventually end up being a grass horse. What, what is it about her that makes you feel that way? Well, you know, she's, she's out of a war front mare. Um, the, her dam was unraced, which, you know, you don't, you'd like to have, um, you'd like to be able to know what she really wanted to do. But, you know, the second dam was, um, you know, a Breeders' Cup distaff starter and grade one winner on dirt. So, you know, she has plenty of dirt pedigree being by Curlin. But that war front, you know, they are they can be really turfy. And um, I just wonder, you know, with the some of the early moves she's made in her races and kind of, you know, she's not really that grinding style. She she has a really good move in her rate on most of her races. And she's hit the front three out of her, you know, three times she's been in the lead in the stretch call. And then a couple of times got run down by some, by a couple of other fillies that are in the Oaks this year. So I just, you know, I think being, you know, trained by Bill Mott, I could see her later on this year uh, getting a shot on turf. Yeah, I mean it's it's something that I think when you're when you're looking at, you know, potentially cutting horses back and switching surfaces, like you mentioned that that ability to make that move on the dirt, that winning move but then not sustain it is is usually a sign of talent, but also a, a horse that's maybe crying out for something else. It, you know, it kind of reminds me a little bit of Frosted. Frosted was that that way going two turns. He always made that move, that menacing move and then would kind of flatten out and then you give him an opportunity to go one turn and he'll give you one of the best races you've ever seen. Yeah, she 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 moves really sweetly, you know. I mean, around the turn, you know, the the last the race, the the Gulf Stream Park Oaks. I mean, she just moved in hand, and you know, the the race announcer really it kind of sounded like he thought she you know was going to be the winner, and and she just kind of flattened out a little bit late and got run down by you know quality filly. So yeah, but she. She's not she's not really been scrubbed on, you know, in really any of your her races to to make the lead. I mean, she 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 has talent, you know. I mean, she's a little light in the, you know, the buyer uh, speed figure department, but you know, you you can watch her run and tell that, you know, she has some talent. She's she's yet to kind of get back, I think, to some of her her two year old numbers, um, you know, on time form and on on the buyer scale, but um, you know, she's going third off the layoff is, and usually that's when most fillies and horses run their best race. I'd be, uh, I'd be making a mistake, I think, and doing a, a disservice to the listeners here. If I didn't ask you what your lean was or what you were thinking about, uh, the Derby, I, I, you always, you always have an interesting horse that always seems to run well, might not win the race, but always 
run well. Who, who's one of the kind of interesting types you're going to try to build some things around in the Kentucky Derby? Uh, you put me on the spot. I, I, you know, I don't know. Um, this year's Derby, there's, like I said, there's just so many lightly raced horses and you look at the PPs and, um, you know, it, there's this, there, it looks very, um, you know, similar to match, you know, that is, it looks like, you know, you could, you could really see a close race where, you know, five or six horses at the eighth pole could win. I mean, it's, it just looks like a really uh, tightly bunched group, you know, as far as speed figures and, and everything. Um, you know, there's been, there's been a couple of horses here lately that's, that's kind of ran big unexpectedly. Uh, King Fury, who looks like he's now getting into, you know, going to, going to get into the draw into the field. Uh, who just won the Lexington, um, you know, Steve Asmussen's um, horse that just won the, you know, the Oakland Derby. Uh, super stock. Yeah, super stock in the Arkansas Derby. I mean, he, you know, he was a long shot in there. And he doesn't like super stock. Can you hear the dog? <laughs> yeah, the kids are home from school and <laughs> Dog barking upstairs, so never fails. Pete always gives me a hard time because the dog <laughs> appearances, my appearances. No, I just I wanted to see you know if you kind of make a good point. I mean, it's a wide open race, obviously, and, and, and those very, are the races. Very where wide we're... open race, you know. I just um, this year reminds me a little bit of the year that Animal Kingdom won. I was kind of, um, I think I was the only person not on a Animal Kingdom that year. And I, I'm gonna have this pop. <laughs> Please, I told you, give me five minutes. <laughs> uh, Daddy daycare. Hey, it's, okay, it happens to all of us. Yeah, but what was I saying? <laughs> Animal Kingdom. You're the only one that wasn't on Animal yeah, Kingdom. I was the only one on Animal Kingdom. And I'm just really gonna try to, you know, pay attention to the workouts this year and see how each horse is coming into the race and. And, you know, I'd see if I can get a, any clues uh, as far as, you know, who's who's really, you know, kind of touting themselves. And, you know, there's been a few years. That's that's how I've uh, some of the best derbies I've had, you know, uh, going way back. I, you know, it kind of shows how I've done recently, I guess. But going back to like Barbaro and Street Sense, I mean, those horses really, really touted themselves uh, the week of the derby and, you know, and I got on those and I had a good derby weekend and not, you know, I needed coat of honor and horses like coat of honor and McCracken too many, too many times here lately, you know, that have kind of, <laughs> I got it done for me. So you and me both, Jack, yeah. I appreciate it. I'll let you uh, go get on popsicle duty. Oh yeah. Yeah. They're, they're popping popcorn dogs barking. Yeah. We're having a party around here. We'll see you soon. All right. Thanks. So if you've watched our shows for any amount of time, you know that we're big fans of animal interruptions. We just had an insect interruption. I, I swear it was a bumblebee the size of a small bird just landed on the shoulder of my next guest. You know her from Talk Racing to me. She is Naomi Tucker. Naomi, are you are you all right over there? Do, do you need a, a can of Raid or something? What's going on? I think I'm okay for now. I was dodging in and out of screen. I've been fighting with this bumblebee ever since I set up outside because the weather is so beautiful. So I wanted to sit outside whilst handicapping. But I'm not a fan of wasps. And for some reason, I can't distinguish between the two until they get really close. So <laughs> I'm just no, the, panic mode. That bumblebee won't bother you. You can leave him or her alone. Don't worry about it. But you're not, you are here to talk about a, a creature, not not a, a bumblebee, but in fact, uh, a filly. And that filly is Ava's Grace for this year's Kentucky Oaks. Curious to get a line on her after her, uh, her pretty big run in the fantasy last time out. Well, what do you think about this filly and her chances on the last Friday in April? Well, that fantasy is certainly her key race. That was her first time stretching out. That was the fire test. That was everyone wanted to make sure that she can go two turns and she can stay that mile and eighth distance for the Oaks. Um, she did phenomenal in that race. I was looking at it, Washington, thinking, all right, Philly. Uh, she was very comfortable getting to the lead. Her ears were pricked. She enjoyed herself in front. She looked like she was settled. That was a 23 flat opening quarter. 
I haven't seen that for any of the other prep races over a mile in 16. And I was going through the PP thinking, has anyone else done anything like that? And then Pauline's pro came up and challenged her, the, the Asmussen runner. She got the perfect setup behind the speed. Ava's grace was not letting her get by without some greediness there. You could see that she was fighting for it. She just probably uh, left a little bit of energy there at the beginning of the race, going perhaps a, a touch faster than would have been ideal. So I feel like if she can tone it down in the first quarter uh, in the Oaks, I mean, she is probably projected to be one of the pace influencers once again, but run a more efficient race. So perhaps a little bit more evenly spread out in terms of uh, energy use, she can improve even further because that was a massive improvement stretching out to the mile and 16. And I do believe reading that Diodoro said he thought from the start that Ava's Grace would excel in route races, that she was a two-turn filly and that this should have been her thing. And it was. I mean, she, to me, duly delivered in that fantasy. And I thought that was, that puts her in the picture. I think we can all agree that put, puts her in the Oaks picture. You're convincing me that further improvement could be to come, looking at the fact that we are dealing with second time uh, going long. That can often be an angle that pretends improvement. Running more efficiently, that's something else that can help. Uh, realistically, do you think it could be enough for her to tangle with the likes uh, of those at the top of the market in this year's Oaks? What do you think you personally, from this far out, I know it can change, but what do you think from here you might be doing with Ava's Grace as far as your Kentucky Oaks wagering plans? I mean, if you look at value, I was looking at the projected morning line that the In The Money team was putting up on social media, 25 to 1, I think is pretty juicy for a filly that I do believe if she runs a more efficient race can continue improving. Now, it's tough to say she can go against the heavy hitters in, in travel columns, search results. When you look at these fillies that you know uh, are running up the 90s buyers, and have proven themselves as being, you know, very gritty racers. Uh, personal favorite travel column. She's by Frosted, who is one of my, one of the horses that I loved uh, watching run. And then I got to meet him uh, up at Dad Godolphin Farm here in the United States. And he's just a gentleman. So I, I'm kind of like in love with this baby. So a little bit of a personal bias here, but also travel column, just a, a very flexible, gritty filly that I feel has learned to also now be closer to the pace than she was in, in some of her other races. So I feel like this is a very flexible feeling. Of course, Brad Cox, uh, we see that with essential quality as well, that the flexibility there, it feels like he preps them to be capable of shooting off from the gates if needed, if that's how the race is projecting, that you could take advantage of perhaps a lack of pace there or take back if there is an abundance of speed. So Brad Cox is doing all right here uh, this year and in the last couple of years. I love travel column, but at 25 to 1, Ava's Grace, I think, is not terrible at all. 25 to 1, I think, is a very decent price. I was wondering if she was going to be shorter than that. I was thinking in my mind perhaps 15 or even tens because that last race was a massive improvement and as you said second time going long is there more to find maybe who do you think will be in the irons will vasquez be back will it be david cohen or uh the jockey who rode her in her last work i, I think was adam Biskitza. so a, a lot of different possibilities for for who could land on this philly do, do you have a theory or any inside knowledge on who it's going to be as from what i I saw there would be rumor that it's Dave and Cohen getting back on board. The only reason he wasn't honoring the grade three fantasies because he was writing Keep Me In Mind in the bluegrass at Keenan on the exact same day for the same trainer. So clearly, if that wouldn't have been the case, he would have been here writing Ava's Grace. I, I do believe uh, they're very strongly considering putting him back on. All right. Well, we'll stay tuned for that story. We'll we'll touch base with you next week, hopefully. Hear you on uh, Talk Racing to Me as your thoughts continue to evolve on both the Derby and the Oaks. Thank you so much, Naomi. And and be careful. Don't be careful of that uh, that bee. Don't don't mess with that bee. <laughs> I'll try. I'll try. <laughs> You're welcome, Pete. And now, one of the trainers that I think most people would be surprised is it's not even really close. The funniest trainer that I know. You wouldn't know it uh, by hearing him in an interview. He keeps it close to the vest. Michael McCarthy. Thanks for having me on. Hey, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Rombauer. Obviously, there's a decision made to not run Rombauer in the Kentucky Derby. I was kind of excited. I thought he was a great opportunity uh, to get involved. He seemed like a horse that would run all day. Uh, is there anything that you feel comfortable or want to share about the decision that you guys made and not running Rombauer in the Derby? Oh, uh, you know, um, 
ownership group has kind of decided that they think that the Preakness is the way they'd like to go. Obviously, by winning the El Camino Real Derby, he's got a free entry fee and a starting fee uh, to run in the Preakness. Um, you know, um, I believe it's 60-something thousand to run in the, in the Derby. Um, personally, I think the horse's style suits the Derby better than it does the Preakness, but this is the avenue they've chosen, so we'll go ahead and go along with it. Um, so well, well he's not going to be running, uh, at Churchill in the first weekend, last weekend of April, first weekend of May, but you do have a Philly that will be running in the Kentucky Oaks, uh, Mraz. Tell me a little bit about Mraz, her story, where she's at and where she's and how she's coming into the race. Have always liked her last two races have been a little bit of head scratcher, obviously in the, uh, lost virginist, she was beat, you know, a short head, uh, kind of got to the front and not sure if she pulled herself up or something kind of caught her attention, but unlucky not to win that day. Um, came back in the San Rita Oaks, had a little bit of a different trip than we were expecting. You know, um, Flavian and his Philly Sue say were able to get up inside of us and they kind of turned into a sprint for home. She's a Philly that doesn't really want that. Uh, long striding empire maker out of an AP Indy mare. I think she'll run as far as they write races. Um, I think the Churchill Downs racetrack will suit her. Um, she may be 20 to one. She may be 40 to one, but whatever price there that she is on Oaks day, I don't think there will be a, uh, a long shot as live as her on Friday. Now uh, we've had these conversations a lot and, and uh, about just the differences of the racetracks that you'll see on the West coast versus some of the ones you'll see East, uh, just a little bit tighter services to the East and, and uh, it's I've noticed you talk about it more than I've heard a lot of other people talk about it, that there's horses that just really appreciate a tighter surface over the, the kind of looser one that you're seeing on the West Coast nowadays. Do you, do you feel like Mraz is one of those that will move up with a tighter surface? Definitely. Uh, California used to be the king of hard and fast. Things have changed there over the last couple of years. Uh, the track has gotten a little bit deeper. They believe it makes it a little bit safer. Obviously, you see times in the afternoon that are – you know, you look at times from last Saturday to the Saturday three years ago, and it's not even close. Um, times are changing. Um, you know, their philosophy is going a different way. So we're racing, although albeit um, our times are slower, but I do believe some horses do like it firmer and faster. They like they feel a little bit more confident on firmer going. Um she'll like that Churchill down surface. Is there a draw? Do you, do you care about the draw at all? Do you want her? Is she, is she a horse that likes to be in the clear? Is she fine in between horses? Is there a, if you got to kind of pick a section, do you, do you care where she lines up? You know, we've run her once a month for the last, you know, three months here. I, my feeling was she was just a little bit short on experience. I think she's got that now. Um, I'd like to be drawn a little bit outside, keep her in the clear a touch. Um, I feel like she's just better that way. Um, and she's one that can't, you, you can't impede her momentum. Uh, she'll get into it. She'll get into a nice rhythm and she'll keep that rhythm. Um, so yeah, I would say if I had my druthers, I'd let, I'd prefer to be farther outside than farther inside. Well, my God, you know, obviously the Kentucky and the Oaks are, are coming up and we're all excited about that, but I, I, there's no way I can have you on here and not talk about, uh, the, my favorite horse in your barn who came back this uh, last weekend and was absolutely sensational. CC, uh, how is she doing? Where do we hope to see her next? She ran lights out over the weekend. Um, I thought she was ready to run. Well, she ran a big one. Um, Victor did a good job of biding his time, stuck down on the fence, waiting for a hole to open. Uh, Mike gave him a little room and he shot on through there. Uh, we've got a lot of avenues we can go down here, hopefully this summer. Don't know if we get on the road and head back east. That's something to think about. Belmont weekend, there's a couple of options. You got the Ogden Phipps. You've even got a race or two at Santa Anita before the meet ends. But I think she's going to come back bigger and stronger. She has come back bigger and stronger, obviously. Um, so I think there's another grade one or two out there with her name on it. Well, speaking of grade ones, grade twos, we'll let you go find a couple of grade ones and grade twos. I know you're uh, winners. I know you're in Ocala looking for, for the next CC, the next Ron Bauer, the next Mraz. We'll let you get to it. We'll see you in Louisville. Thanks, guys. 
If you're enjoying this video, I'm going to take a wild guess that you're going to enjoy a lot of what we have going on at the In The Money Media Network. Lots of great horse racing content daily. Best way to keep up with it is through our absolutely free newsletter. Sign up in the moneypodcast.com slash email. And then if you're really into this stuff and you want all the content you can get, including a lot more actionable betting info, you're going to want to subscribe to our plus service. Very reasonably priced. Check out all the details on that in the moneypodcast.com slash plus. You get digests of all the shows. So you don't have to write down the picks as we're giving them week in, week out. They'll come to you in a separate email, extra shows, extra great written content as well. Check it out in the moneypodcast.com slash plus. I've said this about a few guests on the Oaks and Derby shows, but it so applies to this next guest that uh, I'm going to throw it out there again. One of the most popular guests that we have on the In The Money Network when he comes on, whether he's talking about looking at horses in the flesh, grinding on the paper capping, and and, and sometimes, best of all, just his racetrack stories. Uh, professional horse player, Frank McGoey. Frank, what's up, my man? You need to get a better list. If I'm at the top, I'm a... <laughs> <laughs> need to work on your list. Oh, I would imagine you, you know, you, and I've said this before too, but so important. I mean, really, I'm not exaggerating. A voice of inspiration during the darkest days of the pandemic one year ago, you, you, you know, you, you, you were somebody who was up for the challenge of everything we were going to deal with, and and was always looking through to the other side. How how how's your life doing as we, uh, you know, maybe start to turn the corner on this thing? Everything's good. We actually debated going uh, back this year. Um, my, my first one I went to was Strike the Gold, and then I took a big break, and then I hadn't missed any since Street Sense. So. Uh, so last year, of course, we didn't go. And this year, when we heard that it was going to be like forty percent occupancy, we just said, you know what, we're gonna we're gonna wait till it's wide open because I want the whole experience. It's too much fun. So uh, I'll have a whole cast of, of clowns over here at this place <laughs> on uh, on Derby Day. On that patio, you showed me that uh, that flash patio it, you've got working it, back there. Good. Yeah, it's going to be on steroids. We're, we're <laughs> yep. TVs, a bar set up. I'm, we'll I'm picturing a, the whole thing. We'll, we'll have a number of TVs. We'll have. We'll definitely be affecting the handle that day here. No that's doubt. awesome. I hope you are. I hope you're you're hiring some uh, professional help for the in in terms of uh, the the staff for the party. I don't I don't want to see you back there pouring drinks. No, no, that's not going to happen. No, they, <laughs> they handle themselves. They know hope. They know their way around a bar. <laughs> Well, you're here today, Frank, to talk about a runner that I've talked elsewhere in these videos about having a, a little bit of interest in, Clarier. Very curious as somebody who uh, really likes to watch workouts and, and brings knowledge of how horses move to the equation, what you think of this uh, contender for this year's Kentucky Oaks. All right. So, I, I mean, you just got to think right off the bat with her making her first start two turns around Churchill in her career – that they had to know what they had on their hands, that, you know, she was going to be a distance type filly. And, uh, and she passed that test with flying colors. And, and she came back pretty quick and ran a very credible second in her next start uh, against Travel Column. You know, no disgrace there. And then, uh, you know, off the shelf, that race at the fairgrounds, uh, the showdown between those two, she got the better of Travel Column slightly, kind of snuck up on it towards the inside, cut the corner that day and was able to get travel column late and then the other in, in her last race in the oaks um you know she had a little trouble she was kind of back between horses early and then talamo got her outside she came running she did something she's never done in her other races though when, once she got clear of the second the third place finisher that day um who was i believe super sensation she kind of swapped back to a left lead late um so i mean not a real concern i the i guess the the only real concern I have is that her numbers on, on the numbers, the figures that I used didn't significantly jump from her two year old, her last two year old race to her first three year old race. And then her second three year old race, I was looking for a little bit more of an increase. Uh, but I love the fact that she's got two year old foundation. I love the fact that she's got a win over Churchill. And is there a hotter barn on the planet right now than ask me? I mean, everything they're doing is right. Um, so in clever hands, uh, capable, the one comment I put on her last time, Pete is needs new jock. And guess what? She's getting a new jock. 
I was going to ask you about that. I, I, I think I heard that uh, Tyler Gaffleon worked her the other day. Is that a confirmed booking at this point? I, I hear it is. And, and that's a little uh, interesting that um, Santana is going to stick with Pauline's Pearl. I, I mean, I, I really don't know why that is. Maybe it's just because he's got experience on her and, and the barn wants to keep it that way. But um, I definitely think, no knock against Talamo, another New Orleans guy, but uh, – he it's a step up to Gaffleon. I mean, he's riding very good right now. And, uh, and I think he, he'll probably have this, oh, th this horse doesn't have a, a lot of early speed, but I think Gaffleon's the type of rider that'll have him a little bit better placed than maybe Talamon would have. It's interesting. But I mean, I think he, 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 with all go that ahead. Being said as deep as this field is, <laughs> there's no telling that, that her top effort will be enough. It may be, but I mean, you, you, we look like we got some serious horses in here. This looks like a great race. I do want to ask you your general thoughts on the race and maybe a quick word on the Derby as well. But so that the the the, the lead issue Clarier had, you know, that doesn't usually speak to a horse that that necessarily wants more distance. Just from what I've seen of her physically and looking at her pedigree, though, I thought she and like you said, going you know a mile and a sixteenth on debut, I figure she's got to love the nine furlongs. Where do you stand? What do you think her best distance is going to be? Yeah. Oh, I think she. I, th I don't think the distance would be any problem for her at all. As a matter of fact, in that in the race at the fa in the fairgrounds, Oaks, after she did that, when she straightened back out, she galloped out well in front of Travel Color. Gotcha. I, I, I think, think maybe it was just of, greenness. Yeah, more of a mental thing. I mean, you know, maybe he was trying to pick her up to get her to switch, and and she overdid it or something like that. Um, so I'm not holding it against her. Um, I, I don't think the distance will be a problem at all. Where maybe, does she fit in maybe, the race? It, it, well, she's going to be she's going to be at least you know mid pack or f a little bit further back, I would think. Um, they've got some legitimate pace in the race, and it's going to be a big field. So that's something she'll have to negotiate. You know, you got to see what post she draws. But um, I mean, this is this field's this field's di pretty deep with with some nice horses. Who, who's your short list so far? Understanding that we're a long way out. Yeah. I mean, I still got work to do. And, and you know, the thing about the Oaks and the, and the thing about the Derby, Pete, I mean, it's about the horse that's getting good now. How many times do we get to the end of the three-year-old season and the horse that won the Derby is doesn't want to be in the best three-year-old that year because right. somebody's developing later? I mean, it's kind of just a test as to who is going to, who is maturing at the right time, who's putting it all together because it th these horses are taking such leaps and bounds that even a horse like essential quality in the Derby who's been so, you know, ahead of everybody, some of them could be catching up at this point, you know? Uh, and that can happen with the Phillies too. I mean, uh, as looking at the Phillies, I mean, it's hard to argue that Malathat had every reason to lose her last two starts and she still found a way to win them. I mean, the race at Aqueduct, she was buried back in traffic, looked hopelessly beat somehow got out, and then her stride just kept getting longer and longer. I mean, when they hit the wire, she was just getting going. And it was kind of the same. I think that was a really good horse in past the champagne that got the jump on her the other day at Keeneland, especially with that short stretch. And she was able to overcome that. So I, she's going to really love the Mahler and Eighth, and it's going to be, I mean, she's definitely going to be formidable. Chad's horse search results, she doesn't look like she's done anything wrong. She was another one that was kind of goofing off down the lane the other day in her last start, and he just kind of let her do that. And then when she finally straightened out after the wire, she galloped out well, so the distance won't be a problem there. Um, and pass the champagne's nice. Uh, I'm not sold on the group from Florida. I'm not sold on, on Crazy Beautiful. Um, I thought that the way that Malathat handled – I, uh, help me with this name of, of the mod horse. Milf, what is it? Milf? Uh, Meal four. You, you're from New Milf. Orleans. You can't speak French? No, not if it's, it's not a street in the French Quarter named that. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. If she was named Contaya Toulouse, we'd have that down. <laughs> right. um, but I thought the way that, that Malathat handled Milf oil, uh, she did it much easier than Crazy Beautiful did. And I didn't see a big jump in, and I also like that Malathat and, and search result took significant jumps on speed figures in their three-year-old races. And I didn't see as big a jump in Crazy Beautiful. Uh, so, but I, it's a great race and I'm looking forward to it. I, I still got work to do. I want to see some workouts. I think that's key. Um, that's one good thing about Derby Week. 
because it's not like Breeders Cup where you, you know you got so many horses. Um, you pretty much can see everybody's works in the Oaks in the Derby leading up to these races, and you should have a good idea. I might check in with you next week, and if you have a thought you're willing to share publicly, maybe we'll we'll send that out on Twitter. You're not not a big Twitter guy, Frank, so we we, we can uh, we can pick up that baton for you. Very quick thought uh, from this far out on how you're looking to approach this year's Derby before I let you go. Uh, I'm definitely going to be looking for some value. I mean, so like we were talking about, horses really getting good um, at certain times. It looks like there's some that are starting to blossom, maybe since their last starts. Um, and I got to be honest with you, I saw Essential Quality's last work, and I, I think it's hard to argue that he wasn't outworked by Spa City that day. Wasn't a bad work, but I mean, it, it didn't impress me like some of the other ones look like maybe they're really blossoming. I can tell you this um, I never was a real fan of Midnight Bourbon here at the fairgrounds, but that were his last work at Churchill. That horse was in the bridle like he was never in the bridle down here working. He looks phenomenal. He looks like a That's horse that the, the light bulb came on for him. Um, and Mandaloon looks like he's back training like he was at the fairgrounds before. Whatever happened in the Louisiana Derby happened, because I promise you, that horse is better than that. Yeah. Um, so it, it's just interesting. And, you know, I, I watch a horse like Rocky World. Uh, I didn't go for him to send any of the Derby because I, I was like, I watched his work and I was like, this horse looks like all turf action. And then he wound up doing what he did in the Santa Anita Derby. I, I still had work to do. We're, we're going to see how they shake out over the next couple of weeks. But um, I think that'll tell me a lot as to which way we're going. Franks, thank you so much. We'll get you back on telling some stories real soon. Not a problem, brother. Take care. I hope you feel better. Next up, very happy to be joined by a guest. She's been on a bunch, but probably not frequently enough, given her uh, popularity uh, when she appears on our airwaves and also in the work she does at TV. I've been really loving her coverage of uh, the Keeneland meet with Scott Hazelton on their simulcast feed. Gabby Gaudet, welcome back to the In the Money Airwaves. Thank you, Pete. Always happy to join you wherever it may be and happy to be back on this podcast as well. Yeah, the Keeneland meet's been great. Uh, it's just so nice to be back on track and be back on track with limited fans and the horses. It just completely changes everything. You're absolutely right. The vibe's so good this year between the start of the baseball season and, and the start of Keeneland. It, it gave us that turn the corner feeling as will having uh, the Derby and Oaks back in their proper historical places. You're here today to talk about one who's a little bit under the radar, but uh, elsewhere in this show, I'm not sure in the final running order um, if it's going to be before you're hearing this, uh, viewers and listeners, or after, but uh, the rider for this runner uh, gave a nice little push that we're going to include as a little Easter egg in the broadcast. Maracuja, a little bit interesting for this year's uh, Kentucky Oaks, I thought, and, and I'm thrilled, uh, Gabby, to get your thoughts on this contender. Yeah, I mean, when the Oaks roll around, when the Kentucky Derby rolls around, you have to look outside. You have to think outside of the box, right? You're not going to make money with the main player. So that's why there are wise guy horses that you really need to pay attention to. And I do think that she is one of them. Now, she last race in the Gazelle, and she was far behind search results. Search results was very good that day for Chad Brown. But the difference is that that was her first start stretching out in distance. She had just broken her maiden going one turn prior to that. And we see that, especially this time of year with Phillies, sometimes they need that one race underneath of them going two turns. But I thought it was an encouraging race that she could move forward with. And if you look at kind of the Phillies that have run in the Gazelle over the course of the past several years, the Gazelle used to uh, was run in the fall. Um, and it just changed in 2013 to be used as kind of an Oaks prep. And that year, it actually produced the Oaks winner. Princess of Silmar right. finished second to close hatches. Um, and since then, it's been a pretty useful race, not so much for winners, but horses hitting the board. And I think that's particularly interesting because of this filly. Uh, this pedigree really intrigues me, uh, being by honor code, out of an unbridled song mare who's been very productive. I feel like we've seen uh, with these honor codes a little bit of that old school AP indie vibe of better with more starts, better with more distance. I feel like that might be how I might build my case for Maracuja to uh, potentially continue to improve. What do you think about her from a bloodlines perspective? Absolutely, Pete. I totally agree with you. And it's not so much that they need more distance. It really, in my opinion, has seemed that 
um, the progeny of honor code has needed more time. And especially it's like that second start going two turns, that's the sweet spot. That's when they really start to run well. And clearly that's been the case with her. If you look at her progression in her races with each and every start, she does continue to get better. And it looks like she's taken a while to come around, but she is improving. Um, so yeah, I totally agree with you. Sometimes we see with this progeny, they can be a little heavy footed. And I don't mean that as a bad thing. But sometimes in the afternoon, when you watch them race, it takes them a while to physically get going. And that's not always the type of horses that I like to pick in the Kentucky Oaks or K Kentucky Derby. I think you have to be really light on your, your feet and be able to adjust as is. Um, but I don't really see that with her. I think she does have a little bit more agility and more upside. What do you think about the win end? We've talked about her as maybe a, a potential board hitter. Do you see her as one you might end up at the price shortlisting for the win end? And, and if, either way, uh, what's sort of your shortlist for this race right now? I wish I could say yes, <laughs> but my short list is really, I think the fairgrounds races were very strong this year. Uh, nothing against horses coming out of New York and nothing against horses coming out of wherever the South, South Florida or the West coast. But I just think that we will see the Oaks winner come out of the fairgrounds. Um, I just keep on leaning towards Clary Air. I know she lost a travel column last time out, but those races I think were very strong. And when you look at history and, and where Oaks performers and winners have come from, Fairgrounds holds a pretty strong hand. And Clarier certainly won for a while with that pedigree has seemed like she'd be very much up to this nine furlong uh, task and another who should be a, a pretty decent price. Uh, since we have you, Gabby, I'd be remiss in not asking if you had a quick thought about this year's uh, Kentucky Derby and who you might be selecting in there. I'm between two horses right now, and that's known agenda and highly motivated. I keep going back and forth between those two. I'm not completely tossing essential quality, but you really do have to pay attention to who has the most upside, who has the most potential to improve in this start to peak in the Kentucky Derby. And I see that with highly motivated because Chad Brown, he did it before in the past with good magic. He used the fountain of youth and then he used the bluegrass and then he ran second, unfortunately, to justify in 2018. And I see him making a very similar move and strategy with this horse. He ran awesome against essential quality and i think essential quality kind of hit his max there whereas highly motivated might be able to give a little bit more and then known agenda i mean todd knows how to get these horses to peak on the right day and i see that when you look at his numbers they keep on getting faster so yeah those are the two that i've got my my sight set on good stuff gabby thank you so much for taking out a few minutes today let's catch up for a longer visit soon i hope so always fun to be on with you it's no secret if you've watched any of the In the Money Media stuff the last few weeks that I'm extremely excited about a Philly running in the Kentucky Oaks. And it's uh, for a couple of reasons. One, because I think she's pretty darn talented and I like a lot about her on the racetrack and looking at her past performances, but also the personal connection I have with one of my best friends in the world, Jake Ballas, black type thoroughbreds. Huncho, what's going on? What's up, JK? How are you doing? I'm good, man. I'm good. I, 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 uh, I was worried about you. I, thought, I didn't know if you were going to make it. You were uh, running around your restaurants. You're chasing babies. You've got chickens at the house now, five horses. I'm glad you're with us. I woke up yesterday and said I needed to buy a chicken coop that we're having chickens uh, being picked up the same day. So I'm, they're in the garage now. And, and I don't, I'm not the handiest person. So putting together a chicken coop may take me a couple of weeks, but maybe I'll worry about that after the oaks. Well, I'm going to come over and I'm going to get, uh, I'm going to, we'll get some eggs from the chickens and we'll have champagne mimosas. Who's so gonna, who's going to do the cooking? <laughs> you, Caroline, I don't know. Somebody <laughs> will figure it out. Um, look, man, I, I know you're unbelievably excited. I can only imagine how excited you are because uh, I'm not even involved and, and and I can't wait till the first, the last Friday in, in, in April and pass the champagne. I thought she was unbelievably um game in, in, in the Ashland with her first try going two turns. But I want to talk a little bit about how this happened, how, how you got past the champagne, because she didn't start with you and your operation and under your care when, and under George Weaver's care. Um, on January 24th, when she made her debut, 
for Rusty Arnold, kind of let the listeners know exactly how this all unfolded. So we were, it was, it was a, I think it was a Sunday, or I believe or Saturday. I can't remember, but we were Maddie and I, and Maddie's very involved with our program as well as she uh, helps Josh Stevens, who's a very good bus like agent at the sales. And we we're, we were watching the races and we were gambling and we saw a rusty Arnold horse was 12 to one. And in the doubles, it was pounded and opens up as the favorite. I believe she went off the favorite as well. And so we, we bet on this filly. We didn't know anything about her. And Louis Saez rode. She missed the break. She kind of got rushed up, ran up on heels, just had a very, very poor trip. She got beat seven and a half lengths to a slumber party of Kelly Breen's, who they touted pretty, pretty good. So, you know, we, we try to buy horses privately. We, well, we, We've done so in the past, but we've been looking to try to find something. And right after that race, Maddie looks at me and she says, that's the filly you need to go buy. Put your partnership together and go buy her. So I looked at the connections, Rusty Arnold and Pat Madden. So everybody said, you can't buy a Pat Madden. He's not a seller. Well, all I wanted to do is get a number. So I reach out and I get in contact with, with, with Madden. And he... He's not a seller. He said, I'm not motivated to sell. I love this filly. We think she's a steak filly, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we made him an offer and it wasn't good enough. And he started getting some other offers in. And so he said, you know, you're the first people that contact. Um, anyways, he said, you were the first people to contact me. I was going to, you know, give you a chance to, to listen or tell you what these other offers were. And so it took three weeks. And from the first day I called them, I, I did call George Weaver. And I said, George, you got to look at this horse. And he said, let's buy her. Whatever we have to do, buy her. He calls Randy Hill. Randy Hill calls me. I don't care the number. You just got to get this deal done. <clears throat> well, Randy called, he called me as well. And he said a lot more than that, but I'm with you. <laughs> yeah. It's, it'd be censored. But, and, I'm talking to Maddie. I said, can you believe this? You know, they're going to want more than, you know, it, it was, it was a lot of money. And Maddie said, no big deal. Just get it done. She's an Oaks Philly. So my selling point to all these partners, I said, we're going to try to buy her. There's a race February 27th. Let's break our maiden. We'll go to Goldstream Oaks or Ashland Let's run one, two, and we'll go to the Kentucky Oaks. Now that's just a dream. And, Plans in horse racing, they very, very rarely do they work out. And fortunately, this one has worked out so far. But I, so anyways, I'll back up. So Mr. Madden called me and says, hey, you're not going to like my number. And he was kind of embarrassed to tell me the figure. And when he told me, I took a deep breath and I didn't think we would, we would do it. But I called George and I said, hey, you know, Mr. Madden wants X. And he said, let me go look at her. So next morning he looks at her and he calls me he says get the deal done so a good friend of mine is james brown here in kentucky and his father-in-law that recently got in the business four or five six years ago and i've been trying to get them to buy a horse and i said hey i really like this philly and i gave him the whole sales pitch breaker maiden oaks prep kentucky oaks and most people laughed at me and, and, and Maddie just kept saying, I don't know why you think we're overpaying. I don't know why you think this is a crazy plan. And George was in grants with Maddie. So finally we get the deal done and we, the horse gets to George's barn Tuesday. He trains her Wednesday, works her on Friday. He runs her the next uh, Saturday and, uh, and she broke her maiden. And, uh, you know, then we go to the Ashland and she runs big there. But so and going to the maiden win, my partners from Houston, they fly up. I think we had 20 something people come and I've run a horse in a breeder's cup, et cetera, 10 to one, ran one in the Derby. I've never had as much pressure on me in my life as a maiden race in February at Goldstream park. It was just after paying a lot of money and people in the industry criticize you, you should overpay, overpay it, overpay it, overpay it. Well, it takes a lot of money to buy a good horse and after they've already run, you know what you have to an extent. So we took the gamble and luckily James's father-in-law, there was Rockridge. They, they trusted me enough and James trusted me. And 
Randy trusted me and so did Bill Doherty of, of, uh, of Black Ridge. He's been a great partner of mine, uh, even though we had we had very little success with them and he stuck with me. And uh, we were 0 for 4 with horses partnering together and, and I was almost embarrassed to call Bill when I told him and he just said, go ahead, I trust you. And uh, so look, knock on wood, she ran very, very well in the, in the Ash and we got beat by who I think is the best filly in the country. So we're looking forward to uh, the last. Popular man, phone <laughs> phone's ringing. It's all good. That's all right, man. <laughs> it's all good. Now, uh, Jake, I know you got a, and I think, I mean, I know, I'm sure other people do as well. You got a great relationship with Johnny Velasquez and uh, a personal relationship with Johnny. And when Johnny jumped off after that maiden win, I know he gave you a lot of confidence moving forward that, that, that you had a nice filly. Yeah, I mean, he got off. And Johnny can Johnny can be very, uh, I don't want to say negative, he can be very honest. And I remember we won uh, we won a grade three with Cigar Street, and I walked out there to give him a high five. I said, how about that? He said, off, left, hind. So, I mean, let me get to the winner's circle. I can't even celebrate. Now I know my horse isn't going to come back 100%. And he was right, in all fairness. So he jumped off, so I was kind of scared to even ask him anything. And, uh, but I walked back towards the jock room with him. And he just told me how classy she was. He said, she is super, super nice. She has not learned how to run yet. <clears throat> and she's very kind. The word he kept saying was kind. And she'll do whatever you want. He said, distance should not be an issue at all. And so we had Johnny lined up the ride. And uh, unfortunately, he had to go to California that day. But luckily, we get Javier. And you know, I thought Javier gave a, gave a really good ride. And Javier's going to be back on her for the Oaks. And, uh, you know, and, and, and Javier, and we saw him at Jeff Ruby that night. He was, he was, uh, he seemed really impressed and, and was, uh, anxious to, to maintain the mountain to, to be able to ride her in the Kentucky Oaks. And, and frankly, from my handicapping opinion, I'm excited to, to see Javier with a second opportunity with her. He just got to know her that day, that turn of foot she has off the turn where she opened up in the Ashland, like three or four links. You know, I think that can probably catch a rider off guard when they ask a horse and they give them that that late kick and that kick right there in that spot and continue to improve. Um, do you care where you draw uh, on what, when's the draw? Monday, Tuesday on Monday for the Friday Kentucky Oaks? No, um, I don't think the draw is going to be detrimental to our Philly. She's got enough speed to be forward. You know, going back to the Ashton, she broke last. She got to put herself right in a good spot. And uh, I mean, ideally, I guess you prefer not to be the one or the two. And um, I haven't gone over the PPs to see how much speed's going to be where or how much speed's in the race in general. Uh, but if I had my pick, I, you know, I guess I'd rather be a little further outside than inside. But with her being so tactical and kind, I don't, I don't think it's going to uh, going to hurt our chances of wherever we draw. Well, Jake, black type doesn't buy a ton of horses. You guys. Mm -hmm. uh kind of pick your spots uh the last man i'm thinking the last three horses you've gotten have all been pretty darn good starts you had uh you had up in smoke last year who was undefeated sprinting at one point got grade one placed in the test uh then you had road to success last weekend who debuted at eight to one and ran second he should be a lot of fun throughout the summer and then obviously you've got the success story with uh past the champagne w what's next for black type do you guys have any uh anything you're excited about i know you you bought a philly down at, uh, at Gulfstream, you're pretty excited about. Yeah, we bought an American Freedom Philly uh, at the Miami sale, and we paid $550,000. Uh, we're going to partner with uh, Randy Hill, Dean Reeves, and um, hopefully Black Ridge or Rock Ridge will take a piece, and then my partnership will take um, you know either 25 or 50%, depending on uh, what's left. I thought it was a Philly that uh, had the best – Maybe one of the best works in the sale. I think for the Philly, it could have been the best work. But we're really excited about her. I know it was a lot of money. Uh, again, I took another gamble. It was before the Ashland. And a lot of my partners are pretty excited what's going on right now. And so I just said, you know what? Let's take a shot. And the, if Champagne runs well in the Ashland, it's not going to be hard to, to partner her out one bit. And sure enough, I've got a lot of interest in her. It uh, won't be a problem <clears throat> partnering out. But we think that she's a yeah, – we've never spent that much money on a two-year-old. Uh, and George Weaver doesn't like spending that much money on two-year-olds. Uh, but I think she could. she's going to be special. And, you know, we opened up two years ago. You know, Black Type was just myself. 
and we had I partnered with other people. Two years ago, I did open it up as a public syndicate. And since then, we've had three horses, and like you mentioned, Up in Smoke, Champagne, and uh, Road Success. Up in Smoke has won four out of eight starts, grade one placed. Champagne's made two starts for us, grade one placed. So what we've done with the Phillies have solidified value, if not made made money down the road for being a broodmare. Road to success, ran second, first out, debuting at Goldstream. He's a big, heavy horse that needed the race. Uh, I don't know how good he is. I do know that he's going to win some races, and hopefully he's going to really move forward off that off that race. George thinks he will move forward. So right now, with um, with those three horses, we do have Pat, uh, the American Freedom Philly. We also have a Broken Vow Colt we bought as a yearling. So those will be five horses we'll have in training. Uh, this year, and we're, we probably won't add another one of the two-year-old sales, but we will look to find something privately, uh, just like we did with Champagne, if we think the, it's the right thing to do. Well, we wish you the best of luck. And oh, by the way, one of your favorite partners who's under the black type syndicate, so you don't we don't get to hear his name very often, but a fellow Texan that deserves a call out, my man Reagan Swinbank. The only thing about Reagan I don't like is that he's an Aggie, but he's an awesome dude and, and he's excited, man. He calls me after every one of your races and he's fired up. And uh, I love that about uh, syndicates in general, just getting people involved in this wonderful game that I know you and I love so much. Reagan's one of my best friends for a long time. And he's been my biggest supporter in Texas. And he always, he's been saying for the last however many years, whenever he made a good bit of money, he's going to get back in the horse business. So I held him to that. And uh, he's got me a lot of partners down in, in Texas and mainly Houston. And it is a very, very good group of people. They travel to the races. Last year they couldn't because of COVID. Uh, but they're willing to travel. They all came to Miami. Uh, we had a big party in Houston during the same, same Houston meet. that They all showed up and, you know, they're, they're learning the game and they, it doesn't matter if you own 1% or 50% of a horse. And that's one thing I've learned going along. I used to think I need a big percentage to make me more excited. I make me hit a home run. Uh, it's too big of a risk. So even if you have 1%, 2%, 5%, you still feel like you have 50% of the horse. I got 0% and I feel like when she runs, I, I'm involved. <laughs> You're in, well, we I'm an honorary, I'm an honorary member. No, but Reagan, Reagan's great. He loves it. Uh, and, and he's just a wonderful partner. And, uh, you know, they don't complain. Uh, well, so far, we've had nothing to complain about. So hopefully we'll keep that going. And uh, the Kentucky Oaks, we'll, hopefully we can turn the tables on Malathod and uh, see what happens. Well, Jake, I, I think that uh, a, a phrase that gets thrown around in racing quite a bit is, is good luck. But, but uh, I can't express uh, enough from the bottom of my heart how much luck I wish you, uh, your fiance, Maddie Matt Miller, for picking this horse out. Randy, George, George's entire operation, uh, Black Ridge, Rock, uh, Rock Ridge, um, and, and also, uh, you know, Reagan, the whole crew. I'm, I'm so excited for you guys and, and really looking forward to Friday. And, and like I said, I wish you guys the best of luck. Thanks so much for having me on. Very happy to have another one of the stalwarts of the In The Money Media team up next on the Monster Pod. We've got from Red Board Rewind, Spencer Luganbuehl. Spencer, how are you, my friend? It's been a long day. Seven o'clock right now where me and you are at, ready to get this uh, jumping and have it out to the fans in short order. That's the plan. It will take a minute to uh, get for, for poor Craig to have to do with all the editing, cutting together my stuff, JK's stuff. But uh, we appreciate everybody tuning in. As I always say at the end of the show is making these shows so much fun to do. I know you know what that's all about uh, with some of the fun interactions you get to have with folks uh, on your Red Board Rewind show. I'm sure you're going to have some great coverage of the Oaks and Derby in, right in the aftermath. But let's dive right in, Spencer, and talk about this runner, Competitive Speed. I'm going to say something similar that I that I said uh, on another interview. Even in a year where the figures look a little bit light for the group as a whole, competitive speeds numbers look particularly light. Uh, I'm having trouble seeing it even if I squint. Am I missing something? I feel like last year on the Monster Pod for the Derby, I had the same type of horse that had like improving numbers in the last couple of leading into the Derby. And I said maybe we'll get a fourth or fifth, and I think he ended up like 15th. So <laughs> I'm going to take a pretty easy approach with this type of horse. Uh, yes, improving, but I believe when I had Ashley Mayu on the on the uh, Red Board Rewind, we talked in the, the Devona Dale. I can't remember the last six, seven years in the Devona Dale, horses that have come out of that race as winners who have done well, horses like Jeltrin, you know, 
that was a race that a two-year-old champ came in and ended up doing poorly in that I can't think of her name off the top of my head, but just, I think the Oaks specifically going uh, Florida where it's been good for the boys. I think it's a very negative aspect for, um, for the girls. That's interesting. I mean, if you, you know, I think we're thinking of Vquist uh, talking about the, the, the good uh, two-year-old runner who, who, who made the comeback, but it's interesting to me that you, the, the, the idea that certain paths, uh, Maybe good for the boys, bad for the girls, or vice versa. But we've seen that in the in reverse, uh, I suppose, in Louisiana, as was pointed out elsewhere on these airwaves, where the the girls' path seems to be very productive, and, and the boys' path less so. That that's something you've you've paid attention to, and has proved profitable for you over the years. I, I think it matters. I think just you know we always talk, you know. Uh, even just an overall racing aspects, you know, when horses are shipping from certain spots, we don't want to take the turf horses from the West coast, but we want to take the dirt horses. And I think that, you know, obviously everyone talks, you know, Oh, well, we haven't seen a horse win the Derby from New York in a long time. I mean, it could always come up and happen, but again, like this year, it didn't look that reasonable out of New York either. Yeah, it is interesting just to pay attention to some of these trends. Of course, at the end of the day, it's about the horses. When you're looking at competitive speeds form, what do you see? Do you see any sign of of encouragement? I, I, just, I just see two improving races. And obviously, when you have you know a trainer who isn't proficient in winning, who can put good races together, I just think that you know 53 to 1 in the Devona Dale, and then obviously went off at another big price of 18 to 1, but had improved. You know, it was only third by four and improved the buyer another five points. I mean, we need a 10 point improvement here. And I think that's very difficult when you're facing, you know, for, for how slow, quote unquote, we think the girls are. I think it's the Derby and Oaks is going to be two of the best races in the last five, 10 years. You got to figure there's going to be some some serious stepping up that we're going to see happen uh, from some of the competition. And that could leave competitive speed out in the cold. I know you do have a couple of horses at longer prices in the Oaks that you did want to talk about. Let's do that quickly before I let you get out of here. I'm just super excited for past the champagne. I think that Ashland race was super, super solid, just missing against Malathat, who I really didn't like at all. And I think that she's probably going to end up being my play in that race. I think Ava's grace for how much we talk about Robert Tiniodoro's numbers and how good of a claiming trainer he is. I really like a horse when they just do that first time into a route and the buyer really jumped up. So I think maybe the second time route, Maybe we don't see as much improvement, but I mean, five or six more points up. I mean, there's not many horses with 90s in this race. It's, 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 those are two interesting angles on long shots for sure. Not past the champagne won't be the same level of long shot that Ava's Grace will be. Uh, for both of those, do you think uh, they, do you think they could win or are they more horses you're looking to key around within the number? I, I think past the champagne will be a horse I'm definitely going to key. Ava's Grace will probably be the better price. So I'll probably be playing her to win. Interesting. All right. Good stuff, Spencer. Appreciate your thoughts on this year's Kentucky Oaks and look forward to seeing you cover this and so much more over on Redboard Rewind. Well, I, I never thought I would say this, but I'm here with my favorite person from Arkansas, Nancy Holtis. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. I didn't know you were Arkansas, though. We missed I didn't. Yeah, I, I missed. I, I was uh, I was hopeful to get there this year. I think it was back since 2019 was the last time I was there, and I had so much fun. You were you took us to that fun bar where, where Al Capone used to hang yeah. out, or the Ohio Club, the Gangsta Bar. Yeah. Speaking of gangsters, I didn't know you were in a gang. I see the red bandana. Well, you know it's for the Razorbacks. Got to represent. This is what you get on a on a Monday dark day after a pair of million dollar races. You know so. Oh, I bet you've been busy. I bet you've been busy. Um, you know what I meant to ask you? Have you? How's this new hotel? I saw. I've seen pictures of it. it looks awesome. It is swank. I mean, they spared no expense. Um, it's funny because Robbie Alvarado stayed there uh, the the, le the week leading up to the apple blossom, and he compared it to Dubai, which is amazing. I mean, you literally feel like you're transported to uh, New York, Vegas. Uh, you know, LA, I mean, there is no expense spared. The lobby is sick. Um, I know you've stayed at some really high class places, so, <laughs> yeah. you know, you know, lobby kind of looks Miami ish. I mean, but I love the fact that in the rooms it's hot springs art. I mean, they take the essence of the city of hot springs and the history of Oakland and it's on, it's in the rooms. You feel it. I'm so. excited that it looks like a lot of fun. I, I, I'm going to have to get there uh, probably next spring, but Personal or winter. Yeah. There we go. Um, 
Well, first of all, I, I, thanks for joining us. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about Pauline's Pearl. You obviously are there every day at Oaklawn, so you're familiar with the horses, the fillies that were running in the races leading up. Obviously, Will Secret pulled a lot of uh, wins out of her hat in those spots. Yeah. How do you think the group is as a whole, the fillies that you guys had at Oaklawn this winter? You know, I think it was really strong. Um, you know, obviously, we always say that the road to the Triple Crown comes through hot springs on central avenue but we have been able to produce some really promising fillies the last several years uh pauline's pearl has been very impressive she did make the stakes debut uh in the honeybee stakes and the honeybee has been very productive the last several years uh will's secret was so impressive though dallas stewart and you always have to root for uh, Mr. Willis Horton. He's a local businessman in the state of Arkansas, but the Honeybee was a very effective race for Pauline's uh, Pearl. A very good second place effort when, you know, not only making the stakes debut, but also the first time testing winners. That's always a double big ask is what I like to call it. Uh, a very nice maiden score at the fairgrounds, but when she raced up here at Oaklawn for the first time, it was a really, really good effort, I thought. And it wound up to be, uh, for me, a key race because Will Secret didn't run here in the fantasy. They decided to uh, step her up to a very bigger ask, and they took her to the Ashland. And, I, you know, the Ashland obviously was a very big step up, but she ran a competitive third. So big efforts out of her all around. Now, Pauline's Pearl obviously ran uh, the mile and 16th and got the win. Um, she was a pretty short price that day. She was odds on. D did she feel like a filly to you that's going to appreciate that extra 16th of a mile going the mile and an eighth? Or, or do you think that that's going to be uh, maybe the other direction in terms of distance is going to work out better for her in the long run? Well, you know what? It's interesting because uh, Steve Asmussen actually trained her dam uh, that being hot Dixie chick. And she was a multiple graded stakes sprinter. Uh, she won the grade three Skylar bill, the grade one spin away. Um, so on the dam side, she certainly has that, that quick burst of speed, but by tap it, um, I'm not going to throw out that extra 16th of a mile, but in the fantasy, uh, she was drawing away in the stretch. So she was able to get that 16th that final 16th, uh, very easily uncontested late. Um, Ricardo Santana in the irons as, uh, let's see, we did have uh, Francisco Arietta was on her in the honeybee. And I remember talking to Santana in the jocks room a couple of days before the fantasy. And I said, what do you think, Ricardo? Pauline's Pearl uh, coming up this week. And he says, that's a very nice filly. You know, obviously very basic, very vague, but the fact that he was on her for the big stakes, um, he says, you know what, she's really coming into her own. And we do see that Philly's really coming into their own at the springtime. And if you look at her work, JK, just yesterday at Churchill, she worked with a really nice horse by the name of Abrogate, who won the Purple Martin here at Oaklawn and they went five eighths in a minute and four fifths and uh really do think that uh she is going to be sitting on a big effort and potentially to give Steve his third Oaks victory yeah a minute and four fifths that's pretty fast for Steve I mean his horses don't typically work that quick um very controlled breezes in the morning um you know you mentioned Ricardo and I, and I think obviously Ricardo is one of the best riders in the country, and, and he he shows that every winter, it seems like, now at uh, at Oakland. You get to see him ride every day, day in and day out. What do you think makes Ricardo so good? You know what? Especially when he comes here, he certainly has that confidence. And how could you not be confident riding first call for somebody like Steve Asmussen? Um, one thing that I really love to see is – after they win, after Ricardo wins big races, especially one uh, like Superstock in the Arkansas Derby, the emotion that he has, not only towards Steve, towards the assistant Darren Fleming, but also the grooms, the exercise riders, but also going over to Steve's parents, Marilyn and Keith, and, and to Steve's wife, Julie. 
it, it really does spread throughout the barn. Um, and he has that, not only that work relationship, but also that personal relationship because he's been affiliated with this barn for years. He got his first grade one win with Creator several years ago in the Arkansas Derby. And, you know, I have seen Ricardo get off horses for Steve when Ricardo didn't exactly maybe give his best effort and Steve, you know, not have maybe such kind words for him because it wasn't what the outcome that he wanted. But you know what? These two really are a dynamic duo and we've seen that through and through. So Polly's pro moving forward. Do you think she is a legitimate win contender for the Oaks? Or do you feel like she's the type of Philly that could kind of get involved underneath and in, in exactors or tries or where do you kind of see her ceiling being in this race? Well, you know, kind of look at this. Steve has a couple of really good options in here. Clarier seems to be a, a, a possible contender. I really think travel column is going to be a really solid contender, but I certainly would not count out Pauline's Pearl. We have seen Steve's uh, runners really start to step up. You know, this past weekend in the handicap, we saw Silver State just keep improving, and he got his first graded stakes win and his graded stakes uh return to the graded stakes uh, level. So I like to see these Phillies when they get to Churchill, you just mentioned how powerful of a work Pauline's Pearl put in. So a lot of times we see them really turn around when they do get to Louisville leading up to a few weeks prior to the big day. So I would certainly be comfortable using Pauline's Pearl in my exotics 100%. Nancy, you're the best. I appreciate you taking a little bit of time on your Monday, oh. your day off. And uh, I miss you. I'll see you soon. I hope so. Maybe come see me in Indiana or I'll come stalk you in Louisville. Sounds good. <laughs> Next up on our Kentucky Oaks Monster Pod, we have the editor of In the Money Plus, Tyler Wisman, joining us to talk about Coach, uh, the last horse, as of now anyway, to sneak into this field. Tyler, before we get into that, how are you doing today? Doing great. Thank you, Pete. Curious to see if you think this is a horse who's uh, here just to uh, run in the race or if you think she could be one of these stories that happens from time to time where the, the, the last one in could be first at the wire. I can't make a, a huge case for this one. I have to be honest. Um, I, you know, a couple of encouraging things I think with this one is a run over the track and a good one um, in the golden rod. I think if you actually watch that race, this horse coach uh, made a pretty menacing move around the the turn there and looked like it could be a winner, but was just simply overtaken by both Clarier and travel column who went on to win that race. Um, this horse would then come back and, and knock heads with those at, at Oakland park as well. Um, and they kind of took turns winning there. So it doesn't seem like she's progressed on um, as much as some of the other fillies, namely those two for starters, um, but then as well as um, Pauline's Pearl in the fantasy. So I think she still needs to improve. And although the last may signal that she took a step further, especially when you consider how wide she was um, around the turn, she'll look better on some figures than others. But I just think that there are others that are are probably, you know, have, have like I said, taken that step forward from two to three a little bit more so than her. Certainly would seem to fit on, on pedigree. Should have no problem with the distance. Has run around two turns a couple times now. Um, has no issues there. But, um, you know, I, I can't make a strong case for this. It is interesting that Luis Saez take, picks up this mount um, from what I've seen. Uh, so maybe there could be a slight change in tactics. I don't know. When I'm looking at runners, especially on the dirt, I like to see, I guess, what I would call extremes in terms of pace preference. So either a very fast, you know, opening pace or, or early pace figure or a very fast um, late pace. And when they're, those numbers are kind of close together, if you will, it tends to, at least from my experience, uh, lead to horses that kind of get stuck with with no no trip um, in a race like this, especially with 14 runners uh, around two turns. There could be ground loss that comes into play there just because she she doesn't have enough early speed to get to the lead. And, you know, she's not as going to going to out kick some of the, the deep closers in this field either. Looking back to her run in the fantasy, you did point out there was speed figure improvement there. You pointed out the fact that she was wide, but it, was there anything to you that suggests that further improvement could be coming, or do you think this is more a case of what you see is what you get? Maybe one to, to 
you know, this final work, which presumably is coming up this weekend, um, you know, if she was for whatever reason training out of her skin that, that looked like she was taking another step forward, um, you know, maybe one to include in the, in the bottom. Um, I just, I just think that there are others that I prefer better than the, or more so than this horse. Could you see leaving her in, in the lower rungs of, of, uh, exotics vertically or not even? Well, I, I do think that the top four or five of the, the Oaks race are just heads and tails above the rest of the field. So, um, you know, if I'm using it all, it's in the third or fourth slot, um, for, you know, for anything. I just think that the top three or four horses in the Oaks field are just heads and tails better than some of these. Um, and, and to a certain extent may actually come down to trip um, among those horses. I mentioned at the outset of your appearance that you are the editor of In the Money Plus. I know you've got some special things planned for this year's Oaks and Derby. What can you tell us about those? Yeah, we, we've got a, a lot going on. So we, we've kind of promised a few things and we'll probably do some audibles along the way next week. So we have a, a couple of exclusive podcasts planned, you know, where we'll focus on the early pick five. Certainly there's plenty of attention that's given to the Oaks and the Derby and some of the other stakes races, um, but don't ignore some of the undercard races. And, and certainly, um, you know, they can be great opportunities as well. So we'll look to cover at least one or both of the early pick fives and, and probably cover the $2 two day pick six as well, um, depending on how things shake out. We're going to try to do an ask me anything where, um, as I've said before, I'm going to hunt down you, JK, and others to try to provide answers to questions. You know, on probably Sunday or Monday, we'll solicit questions from our ITM Plus subscribers, try to get the questions that they are looking to get answered and, and provide some more um, directed feedback. Um, we'll have some written analysis. I myself am going to provide a couple of different wagering strategies for different budgets. Um, that's always the biggest request that we have. Certainly people like to, to listen to all of the opinions that are given across the network, both on the exclusive shows as well as the, the free shows, but they're really struggling to translate that into wagering. And, and that's what we hope to accomplish there. So um, that's just a little bit of the preview. And, you know, from a timing perspective, if you sign up now, you're going to get all the coverage through Derby, uh, but also through the Preakness as well. So it can be an advantageous time. One sneaky thing I'll mention about Plus that I like is the digest of the picks on the free shows. Sometimes you're driving, you're listening, you're out for a run. You can't take notes and you remember some things, but you don't remember other things. And the ability to get that little digest with all the, the thoughts of the hosts and the guests out there in front of you on the page. I think it's super useful. Folks who want to learn more, check out inthemoneypodcast.com slash plus. You can also sign up for our free email where you get all the information about everything happening on the network in the money podcast.com slash email. Tyler, we look forward to seeing your work over there on the plus side and uh, we appreciate your time today. Sounds good. Thanks Pete. Next up, we have another multifaceted guest. He's a racing manager. He is an accomplished better himself has bet for a living entirely at times in his life. And he's also uh, off to a pretty darn good start in the world of punditry on the last two In The Money Plus shows he's appeared. He's given you the pick five. He is Blake Jesse. Blake, how are you, my man? Doing well, Pete. Glad to be on here. I'm happy to be uh, leading up to another derby here. Absolutely. Well, this show, we're going to first talk about the Oaks. You're one of the people doing double duty. You'll appear on both of these shows. But let's talk about uh, the Kentucky Oaks and this runner who is not officially in the race yet, but one more defection and she'll get in. And it, it's being discussed that connections would opt to run if that does, in fact, happen. Talking about uh, the Brendan Walsh runner, Moon Swag. This one, the first thing I noticed looking down at her past performance cut is even in a year marked by not terribly fast final figures for Kentucky Oaks runners. Uh, her numbers look a little light. Um, yes, extremely light. And uh, you would think she'd have to be the very first runner, um, you know, on the Oaks trail, uh, you know, that broke her maiden at Albuquerque. So um, <laughs> she's got that going for, her. and, you know, the, uh, you know, the pedigree factor for her is probably the best thing she has going, uh, being a daughter of Malibu moon. Um, she's got things on top and bottom being uh, damn side, uh, you know, from put it back. So uh, that'd probably be her, the best thing going for her. Um, as far as, you know, win chances, I, I really don't see a win chance for this Philly. Um, you know, she, if she does get into the race, I would say her, you know, ceiling would be, you know, super effective, you know, fourth, um, you know, you, you know, sometimes you can get a trip you know, get up the rail and, uh, you know, close in to some crazy fractions and, you know, get a piece. But as far as a win, I just can't see it. 
It's interesting. Tactics could come into play here. Maybe a hold up ride that late run to run on into the number. I mean, there's others I like a lot more in that role. You also noted to me we haven't seen any activity on the on the work tab. Um, that certainly does, it doesn't inspire a whole lot of confidence. Uh, yeah, red flags are up right there. We're 17 days after the Ashlyn and um, have not you know gone back to the work tab. So um, that's you know that's concerning to say the least. We're going to have you on the Derby show as well, as I mentioned. We'll pick your brain about Derby thoughts there. Do you have any general thoughts about the Oaks, top contenders, potential approaches to bet or, or, or anything else uh, like that you might want to share with us? You know, the Oaks for me, you know, it's generally been a, a feast or famine. You know, you're either going to get a short price or a long price. It's uh, it's very rare you're going to get that middle of the road type horse, but um, this year, I, I really don't have a, you know, a good feel for this crop. So I, I would defer to others for this. But um, as far as Moon Swag, I, you know, it's just it looks like things are over her ceiling this year. And um, if she does run, you know, uh, I would I would imagine fourth or fifth would be, you know, an extremely good finish for her. All right, Blake, thank you very much for taking time out to talk about Moon Swag. And we'll, we'll check you out over on the other show as well. That's going to do it for this edition of the show. I want to thank all the guests who took time out of what's a crazy time for horse racing people to appear and talk about their contenders. Thank you also so much to my co-host in this venture and business partner, Jonathan Kinchin. Did a great, great job and uh, thank him for all of his efforts on the network. Who else? You've probably been hearing the quality of my voice deteriorate throughout these broadcasts. So I'm going to thank Hot Water, Salt, Honey, uh, chamomile tea um all for helping get me through this how about some of our partners as well our racetrack partners lone star starting up soon going to be doing a lot of fun stuff with them woodbine waiting for the go-ahead from the ontario government can't wait to get rocking and rolling with them monmouth park they're back with us uh very pumped to be spending time with them as well how about our founding partners let's give them a shout out the thoroughbred retirement foundation trfinc.org slash players to get a bottle of the new In the Money whiskey to join us for the events that we have cooking Derby Week as well. 10 Strike Racing, we really appreciate them. Um, hey, I forgot an important racetrack. Uh, a few more racing days left. Keeneland, always great to be working with them. LTN Global, great to have them in the fold. Digitalrealestatecoaching.com. Uh, check out this for a possible side hustle. If you're a horse racing person, a lot of great stuff going on over there, too. That's going to do it. This show has been a production of In The Money Media. Our business manager is Drew Coatney. Our chief creative officer is Jonathan Kinchin. I'm Peter Thomas Fornital. May you win all your Kentucky Oaks and Derby photos. <laughs>